Introduction of Burt's Treaty of Hawks and Hawking. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kurt Walton. Burt's Treaty of Hawks and Hawking by Edmund Burt. Introduction. Of the three treaties by our old English masters of falconry, Turbeville, Latham, and Burt, that of Burt at the present time is unquestionably the scarcest. In the course of twenty years book collecting, I have heard of but two copies for sale, while in regard to the others, hardly a year elapses in which a few examples do not come into the book market, although it must be confessed at sufficiently high prices, if in good condition. Of Turbeville's work, two editions appeared. Footnote. The book of falconry or hawking, for the only delight and pleasure of all noblemen and gentlemen, collected and C by George Turbeville. Gentlemen, 1575, second edition, 1611. For the full titles of both editions, with critical notes, see Harding, Bibliotheca Asipa Terraria, pages 12 and 13. End of footnote. Of Latham's four, footnote. Falconry, or the Falcon's Lure and Cure, in two books, 1615, New and Second Book of Falconry, 1618. Second edition of both, 1633. 3rd, 1653, 4th, 1658. For the full title, see Harding, Opsit, pages 15 through 17. End of footnote. The treaty by Burt, first published in 1619, has until now never been reprinted, a circumstance, no doubt, which in some measure accounts for its greater rarity. From certain statements of the author, it would seem to have been printed chiefly to oblige his friends and was not intended for general circulation. I did never purpose, he says, to publish in common these my labors, but to have given them privately to whom they are dedicated and to whom I stand devoted. But being discovered to some of my friends, and by them made known to many of the rest, their importunities and earnest persuasions have made me put it to thy press. Farther on, he remarks, in page 8, it hath long lain by me, and that I had not been forward to publish this but in a manuscript, is very well known to many of my friends, but from this may be inferred that only a limited number of copies were originally printed. But whatever cause or causes may have been conduced to its scarcity, the fact remains that at present time the work is practically unprocurable, and this is the more to be regretted, because having been composed by an English falconer of great experience, it is still of utility and value to those who at present day would keep hawks and fly them at game. Under these circumstances, I have undertaken the present reprint in the belief that there are others who will be glad to possess a copy if, like myself, they have tried in vain to procure the original. The text has been set up with great care by Messrs. Ballantine and Hansen by the Ballantine Press, Edinburgh, from an original copy in the possession of Honorable Gerald Lascelles, to whom I am indebted for the loan of it, and it will be found on examination that not only is this a verbatim et literum reprint, but that it, in regard to type and headlines, initials, and other ornaments, it is as nearly a facsimile as it is possible to make without the aid of photography. One hundred copies only have been printed. Of the author Edmund Burt, little is known beyond what he himself has told us in his treaty. He lived at Collier Row, near Romford, Essex, and was somewhat advanced in years and in failing health when he was persuaded to publish the results of his experience as a falconer. Some of his recipes, it appears, he had used for 16 or 17 years, page 103. In his method of hooding, a shy hawk, he says, he did privately deliver to some of my friends by word of mouth above 20 years since, 1599. And some did carefully follow my direction and did not fail. But it was after he had been ill for some time that he began seriously to think about publication. By gentlemen that have come to visit and comfort me, he says, in the time of my sickness, which hath continued with me for the most part of these three years, I have been overpowered, desiring that my knowledge might not be buried with me to thrust out my labors to public view. In page 8. Amongst his friends and acquaintances, a few are mentioned by name. He alludes to Sir Edward Salyard, a knight of high estimation in this art. Page 40. Old Sir Robert Roth, who had an excellent goshawk, Master Rainerford, who had a hawk, are referred to on page 68, and a worthy baron whom he, 
on one occasion met in the strand he did deliver a very sound hawk and had for her thirty pounds page one o six mention is also made of master bachelor that he was master of all the falconers by pals in page ninety five but as a rule his friends and neighbors are referred to as worthy knight to whom i stood bound for many former kind gifts in page eighty eight or two knights both of them very judicious ostringers and two gentlemen of the same family though dwelling ten miles asunder page eighty eight or an ancient and skilful ostringer footnote one who flies a goshawk end of footnote on page ninety six and so forth he used to ride out of essex into sussex to hawk over the downs where he says i have killed for the most part of a moneth together with an intermute goshawk eight nine or ten partridges in a day the day of my going thither and the day of my return to london was just five weeks and it was a fortnight more in michaelmas term when i came back i killed in that time with that one hawk four score and odd partridges five pheasants seven rails and four hares against my will page twenty nine elsewhere in page ninety nine he alludes to flying at the brook that is at waterfowl in leicester he was very successful in training and flying the goshawk to which species indeed his instructions chiefly relate he had for one goshawk and a tarsal a hundred marks both sold to one man within sixteen months for another he was offered forty pounds in page one o five and ultimately sold her for thirty he particularly delighted in pheasant hawking with a goshawk and spaniels and at the time of writing his remarks on the subject he had seven years experience in this branch of the sport in page thirty seven the hints and advice which he gives in relation to it are accordingly most practical and useful the following passage which occurs on page thirty six explains how pheasant hawking was pursued if i spring a pheasant i cannot in the covert have my dogs at the command that i have them in the field let me make all the haste i can after my hawk i might miss of the quick finding her if by my dog's questing i were not drawn where she is it is ten to one she will not hunt for it upon the ground if she should i will teach her wit but it is more likely that she will if the covert with broom or furzes be not thick in the bottom but that she may see it she will as it runneth tend it flying over it from tree to tree and when the dogs do spring it she is so over it as that it will never rise to go to a high perch if it should the hawk would have it before it come there his method of making a shy hawk to the hood in page forty four has already been referred to his contrivance for preventing a goshawk from perching page sixty nine is equally ingenious and it is believed original at provost of the dedication to the right of honorable henry earl oxenford it may be noted that in seventeen ninety five a silver varvel engraved with the name oxenford was found near Headingham castle the ancient seat of this family in essex it is figured and described in the archaeologia volume twelve plate fifty one page four ten and may well have belonged to the nobleman to whom this book is dedicated j e harding burlington house christmas eighteen ninety an approved treaty of hawks and hawking divided into three books the first teaches how to make a short-winged hawk good with good conditions the second how to reclaim a hawk from any ill condition the third teaches cures for all known griefs and diseases by edmund burt gentlemen to the honorable henry earl oxenford viscount bulbeck lord sanford and scales and lord great chamberlain of england my honorable lord i never affected flattery if i had i should now have been much disappointed for your noble worth exceeds what i can say to particularize your honorable titles or here to blazon your excellencies were needless and shall rather be printed on my faithful heart than published by my ruder pen especially upon the dedication so slight a subject sir i have long awaited for opportunity in this great while with occasion on whereby i might tender some open testimony of my love before i die which may remain a perpetual memorial of my ever devoted service to that end my lord i have run back into my younger years 
to some of the delights of my able youth, together with the fruits of my more experienced age, comprised within a few leaves, to attend your lordship's leisure, and humbly to crave your honour's patronage, to arrogate to myself by an immoderate commendation of the work were poor, to derogate too much from it through modesty were as a silly, therefore not to be excessive in the one nor too liberal in the other, I would, with your honourable favour, do you thus much to understand. As for the subject, it is not weighty, being but a treaty of sport, and to attend and to give place to your lordship's honourable affairs and more serious employments. But as for the handling of the subject, I dare and will boldly say and aver it is good. Nay, I will submit myself to partial censures upon due trial and hazard my reputation upon true judgment. My lord, I frame not my wavering surmises upon probabilities sink decunt, but I ground my constant opinion upon certainty of problem est, nor can I quote any author but myself, and out of my own industrious experiments, I, first, extracted my own conclusions, I reap no man's harvest, but plough with my own heifer. In fine, I here dedicate to your lordship the delights of my childhood, the pleasures of my youth, the experiments of my age, my faithful, though painful labors, my fruitful, though slight, endeavors myself, my continual service and observance to your truly noble self, humbly requesting your honor not to be ashamed to patronize it that to which your servant is not afraid to present, and that shall crown my poor endeavors, and give my labors an eternal sufficit, and make me ever rest. Your Lordship's humbly devoted Edmund Burt. To the friendly reader, friendly reader, I did never purpose to publish in common these my labors, but have given them privately to whom they are dedicated, and to whom I stand devoted. But being discovered to some of my friends, and by them made known to many of the rest, their importunities and earnest persuasions have made me put it to the press, whereby I shall be censured of such as have left judgment. But let it be answer for itself. I have not set down anything so erroneous, but being well examined, it will prove judicious, and although this subject hath already been dealt with all, and well handled by a gentleman of good experience, whose good and probable discourse might be a means to hinder my proceeding herewith. Yet a great many gentlemen to whom the goodness of my hawks have been known to be such, as they could not be bettered, do strongly enforce it, that my skill, art, and knowledge must be in the same degree. In truth, I have not kept any hawk about three years, but I have put them off for much money, besides many thanks and much love. I had for a goshawk and a tarsal, a hundred marks, both sold to one man for sixteen months. I know there are many of good experience, will overlook this my book, and some that are young professors, and some that would learn to profess. But whatever he be that understandeth this profession, I will wish him an able body, a quick spirit, and most of all an earnest love and delight thereunto. To such a man a hawk will quickly teach knowledge. But of him that wanteth wit, he will make a fool, and of a dull spirit, a true pack horse. If these good properties shall be wanting in a man, he is hardly to be made a good ostringer, and it will be hard for him to make a good hawk. I would, I were able to deliver plainly what I understand. I will set down, as familiar as I can, the best instructions I am able, but knowledge and understanding, loving practitioner must be gotten by thy diligent and careful observing thy hawk in her sundry passions and sudden toys such vigilance such diligence and such carefulness will work such an apprehension in thee as in a little time thy knowledge and understanding will bring forth such effect as thou wilt be able to prevent all her ill inattendments i cannot set down what thy experience will teach thee but I rest to give thee full of satisfaction by conference that I have herein or can possibly publish farewell. From my house at Collier Row, near Rumford, thine too is power. 
Edmund Burt. End of introduction. Chapter One of Burt's Treaty of Hawks and Hawking. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kurt Walton. Burt's Treaty of Hawks and Hawking by Edmund Burt. Chapter One. The author's opinion of the goshawk and tarsal, and of their difference, all of which he writeth unto them that are of the small practice, and to them that would have their labors put to their best profit. The goshawk is most able to endure much, and is more profitable than the tarsal, not only with bringing home many quarries, but with bringing diversity and variety of their quarries. Her disposition is meek and gentle. If she be mildly dealt with, and not so apt to ill conditions as is the tarsal, she is subject to seek for poultry, and to which fault she will never fall, except it be through want of knowledge in her keeper, which fault to prevent, as also how to reclaim a hog, from that evil condition, or any other, I will hereafter give most plain and true instruction in his proper place. Chapter 2. Wherein the tarsal differeth from the goshawk, except it be for his practice, I would not advise him that he cannot rightly affect all things in a goshawk to meddle with a tarsal for he is apt to ill conditions which every good ostringer if he will is able to prevent he will take dislike at many things or at anything he is apt to royal and sometimes may find poultry that is fit for his turn and if he once take a liking and stand well affected that way there is none unfit for him he will quickly know a dove house and too soon learn to find the way into it and then he hath wit enough to please himself but these faults and many more follow such hawks as are not well handled but are harshly and unkindly dealt with in their first manning he is light-headed and nimble-winged the quick handling of them in his flying pleases more than the goth hawk and therein the spar hawk exceeds the tarsal and the merlin therein exceeds both goth hawk tarsal and spar hawk they may fitly be compared into a large gelding, and a smaller. The first having a large and long stroke goeth faster than he seemeth. The other that gathereth short and thick seemeth to go much faster than he doth. The larger shall enforce the lesser to strike thrice for the ground, that he will almost it twice perform. My opinion is, he that riddeth most ground, with most ease, shall longest endure. Judge yourself the difference between the goshawk tarsal and sparhawk chapter three of goshawks there are three several kinds and so of tarsals the haggard hawk the ramish and the eyes much differing from the rest i only write now the differing dispositions of these hawks and other several properties and of the inconveniences that followeth them in particular first to the haggard in general she hath long lived at liberty having many things at her command and she is therefore the harder to be brought into subjection and obedience. In her first manning she is apt to take every accidental occasion that giveth offence to come from her keeper. As a young horse in his first riding, if he shall bog or be afraid of something, if his rider shall then spur him upon it, the horse must thus think that the thing were upon now in fear all his thoughts are placed is the true moor of the spurs that torment him so the haggard tied to her master's fist that baiteth and then find her restraint the object taken away she will stare at her keeper in the face and think all the offence came from him to whose fist she was tied otherwise she had been at liberty could have freed herself from whatsoever feared her but let me speak now this more than i purposed lest hereafter in his proper place i may forget to give that caveat in the haggard be so angry as that she stare thee in the face upon such an accidental occasion or sudden thought of her present bondage own it not see it not and by all means possibly carry thine own eye from looking upon her for that will work more dislike towards thee which if you observe you shall sooner find her pacified she seldom meweth timely or orderly and although some can say that they have had a haggard goshawk mewed well and fair fit to draw at bartholomew i answer one swallow maketh not a summer 
When the haggard is flying, nature is altered, and therefore I must not here speak of her good or bad properties at that time, for they are wrought in her through the good or bad discretion of her keeper. When she is in making, or after she was made, as her keeper thought, I will leave those to their proper place. Only I say, and so conclude, that your haggard is very loving and kind to her keeper. After that he hath brought her, by his sweet and kind familiarity, to understand him. But if she fall into any vice, she is most hardly reclaimed from it, and brought to good perfection again. If it shall be hoped for, it shall soonest be gotten and performed by exchanging her keeper, if his skill may equal her former keeper. Chapter 4 of the Description of the Ramish Hawk There is a small difference between the haggard and the ramish. Only the ramish hawk hath had less time, by praying for herself, than the other, to know her own strength and worth. But in maining and making her I will set down my whole practice, with my friendly advice to others that will enter into the same course, for in the ramish hawk is my especial delight, for in them my labors have proved most successful. Chapter 5 of the Ayas Hawk, upon whom I can fasten no affection for the multitude of her follies and faults. I feel it most burdensome to spend my time idly. I think the difference little, either to be idle or spend the time to no purpose, or be long doing a little, in such effect his travel will give him for reward that metal with, with an ayas, except the long expectation of good will will give him satisfaction, for they are so foolish as the first year they will hardly be taught to take a bow well, and if that cannot be effected, there can be no prosperous success expected. I have known some that have not proved very excellent the second year in taking a bow. And then it is a foul fault to do nothing the first year, and not very much the second, for I have seen diverse inner mewers hang with their head downward, holding a bow fast in her foot or feet. I have known some of them, likewise, that would sooner catch a dog in the field than a partridge, and although she had flown a partridge very well to mark, and fat well, Yet so soon as the dog had come into the retrove, she would have had him by the face. One other, as ill a fall as this, if she fly well, yet it is odds you shall find her sitting upon the ground at mark, when although you keep your dogs quietly behind you, and though you use some course to terrify her, or take her between your hands and throw her up, you may perhaps find her folly. Give her leave to fall again upon the ground, within twelve or twenty yards of you. Fear the worst, the best will help itself. It may be she will not go to a tree at all. This is grievous. Neither will most of them like the hood well, and many of them will cry as loud as you, as you will speak to them. Neither can I hope to buy a sound hog of them from the cage, who knoweth not that they are hot and scratching upon the quarry. Art will easily amend that fault which I will not fail to deliver in its place. But this I say, if a man have the patience to endure their impatience, and attend a long time for their good proof, if at the last she shall prove well, she may be ranked among the best in the highest degree. She will ever mew orderly and timely, and expect some evil accident shorten her days. She will live longer than any of the rest. She is not apt to be sick or surfeit so soon as the other. Yet if a sicken should befall her, she will outgrow it with less danger than the other. In this discourse I have altogether spoken of the eye's hawk, but the tarsal is not so unapt to take a bow, neither is he apt to catch dogs, if he prove well. There can no attribute be given to the ramish tarsal, but all quantities examined. He shall own as good or better, and thus much is concerning my opinion of the eye's hawk. Chapter 6 To the Friendly Reader Friendly Reader, before I begin to treat of the ramish hawk, and to set down the courses whereby I have made so many and so extraordinary good hawks, as they could not be bettered, both for flying in good conditions, I must tell you, and so far explain myself, that I do not therein so much arrogate to myself as to think my courses are not to be equaled, but they may be bettered, even by men that live in obscurity, 
but for what I write is my opinion, from which, although it shall move others but little, I cannot be drawn, because I have had thereby so good, so prosperous, and so profitable success. Some may contrary my opinion, who can for themselves say but as I do, that their opinion is such. If I cannot set down sufficient reasons for my proceedings, my hawk shall testify for me. It has lost laying by me, and that I have not been forward to publish this but in a manuscript, is very well known to many of my friends, gentlemen that have come to visit and comfort me in the time of my sickness, which hath continued with me for the most part of three years, in all which time I have made but only one hawk, but diverse have been brought unto me to be cured of diverse diseases, and some to be reclaimed from ill conditions. And by these gentlemen I have been overpowered, desiring that my knowledge might not be buried with me, to thrust out my labors to public view. And although my memory hath escaped some secret, yet I am assured that the skillfulest shall find something herein set down, that neither he nor any man hath made use of, either in making his hawk of good and fair condition, or in reclaiming her, or any other of their kind, from any ill condition, and thus followeth my direct course for the reclaiming, maining, and making of my short-winged hawk. Chapter 7. The Manner How I Have Used the Ramish Sore Goshawk After I Have Taken Her From the Cage Unto My Fist Until She Hath Been Flying I must speak something of the time wherein usually I make choose to buy my ramish hawk about the latter end of Michael Amos' term, or if I can learn that there are more hawks coming before Christmas, I will tarry their coming, for those hawks do not show themselves out of the great coverts until after St. James, and to buy one of them in the beginning of Michael Amos' term that hath been so long taken and done so little for herself, I like not. But I will hope for a more late taken hawk, which, when I have, I follow in this manner. I continue her upon my fist ten days or a fortnight. Unless in a shorter time I find her a sound hawk, which I shall sooner understand, because I see how she putteth over her meat, how she doth and do it, and if there be any doubt of her well-doing. There shall hardly a mute escape my sight, whosoever doth carry her for me, for she shall be well assured to find no other perch than my fist. From that time I rise, until I go to bed, when she shall go with me, and if in this time I find it fit, she doth not fail to have casting. I find no time lost in this course, for in this time I will raise my hawk and give her strength, and she will be the less time after she is unhooded before she doth fly. My castings that I give are thrums gotten of the weaver. I get them washed, but not with soap. I cut the threads an inch long or less, and I size them out for a small casting, and give them loose with her meat, or otherwise. I tie upon the threads two or four small knots, leaving some threads open at the end of either knot. Otherwise, I give plumage and some small bones. If the fowl like me, the bones of that part of the wing that is usually broken from the partridge. Flannel I could never approve of, neither did I ever use the jukes and feathers of a house dove, for they, by reason of their own dung they sit in, are hot and strong in flavor. I am careful not to make my casting too great. I think there is no man but hath that care if he but undertake to feed a hawk. When I find my hawk in strength of body and stomach bettered, I proceed to peppering for I will let nothing escape me unset down in the whole practice of my hawk, until I have made her flying. Although peppering be as common with every man as feeding, yet because I have known and heard of many hawks that have died upon peppering, when I had younger experience, I grew very careful thereof, and I took this course. First I made my water seethe, and then I put thereto a quantity of pepper, and a less quantity of Doss acre pounded small. I put in the less of both, because I see them in water, which maketh the water strong. When the water had sawed a while, I did strain it through a fine linen cloth, which had suffered neither pepper nor stoss acre to go through, and therein I would then wash my hawk. My reason why I do not allow of, 
nor use the common course of peppering as this. The water not strained through a cloth, the pepper hangeth in the hawk's feathers, and when she falleth to pruning of herself, she oftentimes getteth into her beak, and so it hangeth either upon the tongue or in the mouth of the hawk, and setteth it on fire. The heat and dislike whereof maketh many hawks to cast their gorge, and so their sickness increasing, they die. Besides, I have come many times to some places four or five days, or a week after that they have peppered their hawks, and I have seen the back part of their wings red so long after the peppering, there may thereupon grow, although not suddenly, an incurable blister, which will lame his hawk, and her master shall never know how it cometh. But with the roughness of pepper, and with the ill handling of them that have executed that office, I have many times seen the skin of that place rubbed off. If any man will follow my course, he may, if not, let this warn him of the inconveniences that follow the other. Many hawks having died upon peppering, my reason can find no other cause than what is aforesaid, or else a great fault in her keeper that would put his hawk to such a hazard before he had made her body able and fit for it. My place of peppering should be in a very warm room. Although the fire were not very great, I cared not. My time should be in the evening, and for my company I cared not how many, both men and dogs, the more the better. For then the hawk, seeing so many things, that any one of them might give offence alone. There is now so much change, men, dogs, firelight, and candlelight, that she looketh at all, and knoweth not which to be afraid of. Besides, she hath a desire to dry herself, and so let her continue until she shall be dry, and hath picked herself. By that time I would think it time to give her some meat, and that should be but a little. She had none above one hour before I began to pepper her. My hood is laid away with no purpose to handle it before four and twenty hours were spent. That night she never went for my fist, but when I entreated my friend to ease me. But no, I seldom did sit still with her, but I would walk, and when I walked, or whether I sat still, I would entreat my hawk not to be idle, and in this manner to walk and travel with me, very often turning my hand gently, forward and backward whereby my hawk should be made, leisurely to remove her feet one after another, forward and backward. I had rather she gently remove a foot, than with anger strike a wing, and the often removing her foot will save her many a bait. It may be your hawk, good friend, shall want that attendance that mine hath had for a fortnight before. If you fail in the beginning, look for no successful ending. It is very like you shall find yet at this time, when she will distemper and overheat herself with baiting, which my former course has taken with my hawk, assureth me that I need fear no such thing. To proceed, I with my hawk upon my fist walk, and I entreat her to do so likewise, by the general removing her feet, which she should practice that matter to watch her this night, but it will be almost impossible to keep her waking. I have heard of some that have watched their hawk seven nights, in as many days, and still she would be wild, ramish and distorted. No, good reader, that a little sleep will suffice nature in any creature, and when a hawk is upon the fist, the man spending his time with sitting still, talking, or at tables, he may be virtuously spending his time in reading the scripture. In this time, his hawk sits still, she hath no exercise, and there is little difference in this, either to be upon a perch or his fist he may say if i should set her upon a perch whensoever it were in her sight she would bait to go to it i ask what is the difference between baiting to go to the perch or baiting to fly from all things else and thus you shall never have her a well-manned hawk what are the discommodities that follow a hawk thus manned she will endure nothing because she hath not been made acquainted with anything for when her master or keeper should see her to take offence or dislike, he will avoid that, because she shall not bait. Another while, he crieth out, Come not in the tail of my hawk, but whosoever shall undertake the course that I have used, he shall find his hawk seldom apt to take any offence at all. In a man's much sitting still in the time of 
maiming his hawk, an ease apprehension will find a great error, for when the man sitteth still, the hawk sitteth still. And if she hath been truly watched, although she doth not wink or shut her eyes, yet her heart may be fast sleeping. Or if it be in the day, so long as her keeper sitteth still, she will be quiet, but let him but stir and walk. She liketh not that. She hath sitting quietly upon his fist, and she is very loath to have that custom broken. Every offspring of any experience knoweth that a hawk thus used will thus bait. Why is it so? Not because her eyes meet with that which sitting still she saw not, but because now she meeteth labor. She is angry and discontent, because she is not as she was sitting at ease. A hawk before she is truly manned, and that hath been set and used unto a perch, will perpetually bait to be there. I hold it a great error to set her hooded, because she should not see whereon she sitteth. For sure I am this fashion will breed more than a little inconvenience, and yet hereby there is no love gained from his hawk. I have observed that it is much walking with my hawk that hath wrought such good effect in her. For in my walking and turning her eye, doth still behold change of objects, and the stirring of her feet doth work as much or more good in her, for that maketh her desires to sit still, and desires to ease, which baiting doth not give, and in the first making saveth her many a bait, as at my first beginning I labor to acquaint her with whatsoever a hawk may dislike. So my manner of working this is by that means which otherwise she would dislike, and that is carriage and in this beginning to make my fifth her perch, until she be such as I would have her, which this night and the next day shall make her, for this night is but the second night, and now my chiefest practice is the using her to the hood, which she will as familiar take as the falcon. I will show you my manner therein. I show her the hood, put it to and over her head many times. I find her so truly manned, as that she will no more dislike the stroking therewith than the bare hand. I put it on gently and very leisurely, and I could never meet with any dislike hereof in my hawk. I would either put it on with my full hand, or else holding it by the tassel, whereby you may know that it was leisurely and gently done, which will be a means that, that she shall never hereafter be coy of it. But if my fine offstringer will show us dexterity and nimbleness of the hand, and with his finger in her neck, thrust her head into the hood. If he miss the right doing it, the next time he cometh in such a manner, he may peradventure find her dislike. This is the next way to make her think her head shall be pulled off. For the putting it on in such a quick manner, or thrusting her head into the hood with the finger behind, will make the hawk understand that it is no kindness, but violence and churlish usage which must never be offered a hawk, and then you shall perhaps find her dislike your hand and hood coming to her, and so being a little coy or angry, never be content to carry her beak right, but turn it in the hood, and so my fine quick hand bobbeth this hawk, and maketh her utterly dislike the hood. There is no way but gentleness to redeem a hawk so bobbed, and therefore I advise thee not to trust to the quickness of the hand, but rather to hold the hood, by the tassel to her head, and then put it on leisurely with a light carriage. You may say she will not suffer this, so thinketh I also after she hath once taken a dislike thereof, but I spake in the beginning of how to use your hood, so as she shall never with such usage take dislike thereof. Use her as I have used mine, and you shall find yours as I find mine. Admit your hawk shall turn her head away from the hood. I know she will not bait from it. Perhaps she will likewise turn her body from the removing one or both of her feet. Upon the putting her head aside, I would still hold my hood within an inch of her head, until she should turn her head and then put it on leisurely. But if she stir her body and remove her feet, then pull back your hand, and by turning your body and your fist whereupon she sitteth, set her right and sit, and then hold the hood gently to her nose, which she will be willing to put her head into rather than stir any more, for she knoweth there is no hurt ensueth. I could with ordering of my hawk, 
as I have already set down, never find any hawk at a worse pass than so. Well, she is now well made acquainted with the hood. The morning cometh, which I have said before, rejeweth all her spirits, which before were heavy and dull at the beak of day, getting company and dogs with me, or in the town, or rather where I should meet with most passengers, there would I be walking, hooding my hawk, and sometimes let her feed after her hooding. After one or two hours, being abroad, I would into the house again, where my hawk should show herself as sociable and familiar as a lander. I use altogether a low perch, which set in the middest or in such place of the room wherein I was, as that both men, women, and children, and dogs should go by her. I did not fear, although they did wipe their gowns against her. I ever found them so glad of their ease. The second day I know my hawk as well maned as I can desire. It may be I will set her down upon such a low perch, and in such a place as I have foresaid, and I know there she would sit, not fearing anything, and not making one bait in two or three hours. If I would let her sit so long, which as yet I must not, unless hunger should enforce her to stir, I make no doubt but she would be very gentle to take up, if she do not jump to the fist. Now I follow her with castings, and I keep her upon my fist until I go to bed, and now I am able to govern her, not needing any more help, and yet I pray think, that I know if she be not held and kept in this good perfection, she will fall again. But all this I am able to do, only with the weight, sitting up, and early rising. I feed her so as that I know she shall cast the times, which I will carefully look for one hour before day, and when I take her up, I will surely please her with something. Then I fall to my old trade again, walking abroad as I did before, using her hood as I find cause. I never call her above eight or ten yards, until I find that she is bold enough and not fearful, and that she be fair in love with my voice, which I never fail to give her, even from the beginning of her feeding, until she is flying, and that is loud enough, as if I were to call her thirty or forty score, although I call her but ten yards. Well, when I begin to call her in cranes, although it be for so small a distance, it shall be done from the hood, and from the fist of another man, in manner as your long winged hawk is lured, and when I call her twice or thrice at a time, between every calling I put on her hood, and so still I have her let in from the hood. Who knoweth not that a hawk set down upon a stile, block, or any other convenient thing, when she shall, with the often seeing the cranes drawn at length, and her keepers accustomed to manner in calling her, soon learn to know that now she shall be fed, and will be ready to follow him before he can get twenty yards from her. But all this is not to the purpose. I have seen Haggard, with four days calling, not suffer the going from her five yards, but she should have been at his elbow after she had been once set down, and yet she was far enough from the perfection of coming, for it is the voice that must not only in this but in greater matters work a good effect in my hawk. As I am thus calling my hawk and cranes, it is very certain she will soon come to that understanding as that she will bait upon hearing my voice before she be unhooded. I then stay my voice until she be quiet. Then I call again, and then she stay my voice until she be unhooded. And again, I give my voice not holding out my fist unless I see her coming. My experience has taught me to stay her and not to let her come until she be quieted, because I have seen long-winged talks with which profession I have made an end thirty years since. Let into the lure in the time of their baiting, when they have had their eye presently settled upon some other fair remote from the lure, whether they have presently gone and then not come to the knowledge, could not find the lure, and so have been lost. I spent two, three, and often four times of the day thus in calling my hawk, then for the day, for the most part, my fist is her perch, and if I set her down, it shall be ever upon my low perch. Well, all sorts of people and dogs shall find travel by her, where she shall see the fire stirred and blown, and wood brought thereto, and diverse other such like objects. 
she will not for any or all of these make a bait. In this manner I have trained my hawk, that when she hath been a flyer, I durst set her down upon a velvet stool in a cleanly kept dining chamber or parlour, as the place whereunto I went, for I would have my hawks as much in my eye as could be. Perhaps I should see the lady or mistress of the house look discontently hereat. So well have I been acquainted with my hawk's good disposition that I have promised if my hawk should make a mute in the room I would lick it up with my tongue. For well I knew no angry mute should come from her, otherwise she would not mute. And I know well, unless I were negligent, which I would never be, that she would not stir until hunger did provoke it. This for the day. In the evening when I had called and supped her, then I would no more let her part from my fist, but continue until I fed myself. It may be if I had such means, she should not be upon the fist for that season also. And so until I went to bed, which the love to my hawk would not have hastened me. In the morning, before day, I would assuredly have her upon my fist, and follow her in such manner as I have formerly done, thinking that I could never be too frequent with my hawk, nor she with me. My inducements to carry her thus in the evening and night would make her love me as her perch, and by my taking her up so early in the morning, I would persuade her that there had been her perch all night. But whether my hawk will have this loving apprehension, or no, I would know not, yet I am assured it worketh this benefit, that she will endure me as much or more than any other hawk not so dealt with, and it is this that maketh her so willing to sit still and take her ease and not take offence, although there should fly about the house fire, dishes, trenchers, and anything else that would make mad other hawks, they shall not move her. Methinks I hear some man say, I have taken a very painful course in making my hog. I ask who will not fast one day to be assured that he shall feel no want so long as he liveth. Work but out your task in this fashion, and you shall during your hawk's life find none but playing days. Let me not omit anything in my proceedings. As for the hood, I never in the house let her sit unhooded at all and when she is a flying hawk, never unhooded in the field. Be not negligent towards your hawk at no time, but especially while she is a manny. If you be, she will pay you for it in her flying. I am afraid to be tedious, and I cannot more briefly deliver my practice and my experience. I would gladly walk plainly and give unto every man full satisfaction. I should have forgotten one special benefit that is gained by your three nights painful following your hawk, that is, she shall not at all weaken herself with many baits. Also her familiarity will be such, as that you may thereby better her diet in her calling, and of a poor hawk from the cage, make her strong and full of flesh. The contrary no doubt followeth those hawks that are by fits dealt with all. One while carefully watched and manned, and to another time neglected, and then their diet shortened to make them comfortable at a keeper without form. Hence proceeded the marring of many hawks, that when they should be entered and fly, they are so weak as they are not able to show what they would do if they had strength. If this not be motive enough to make you have a care of your hawk's decaying strength and her falling of flesh, then you know that poverty is the mother and nurse of all diseases. I have followed advising too long, and less the delivering of my practice. Now to perceive therewith my hawk is to be called loose. She shall not be weakened or hanged with dragging her cranes about eight or nine score. And my manner is to call her thirty and forty score before I put her into a tree. And I use to call her at all hours in the day. I fear not her coming home unto me but admit what I have not met with, that she falleth off and go to a tree. It must be want of a stomach that maketh her do so, or want of weathering or bathing, which I will be sure she not want. Neither do I think she should want a stomach, which if she should want, that will make her sit quietly. And I had rather attend her pleasure with patience now than when I am in sport. 
I will tell you something touching this point. When I am traveled with my flying hawk, that is, as loving, as sociable, and comfortable to my will in all companies and times as I can desire, yet I do bear her barefaced for the most part of all my journey, and when I perceive she groweth hungry, then I put on her hood, and if there be no present hope of a flight, I set her upon the fist of one that knoweth what doth thereunto belong. Then I pray to him, ride hindmost of the company, and I put myself foremost. Then I call my hawk. When her hood being pulled off, she cometh by all the company merrily to the fist. Use maketh perfectness. Thus I use my hawk, and she never receives meat from me, but I call her. It may be you will be advised hereby to do the like, if you once find the benefit thereof. You will hold the greatest pain in effecting it, sweet contentment and pleasure. But to my hawk, which doth not so, but granted she should do so, make me wait her pleasure. I am not too hasty to call her until she hath taken her pleasure, which my observation I will soon discern, and then when I call her, I know she will soon please me, and so conclude, we are both pleased. But if such an accident should befall me three or four nights before I went to fire, I would not fail but show her a partridge the next night. If I could get a hand partridge, it would please me. If not, I would not be at all sorry. But such a chance hath seldom befallen me, and therefore to hold on with my true proceeding, when I have my hawk perfectly coming, strong and in all points fit to fly. The night before I show her a partridge, at sunset, I set her down upon some stile, gate or rail, and walk from her. I would choose a place where there should be many high trees. I would not give her my voice until she went to a tree, but I would keep myself with my company twenty score from her, unless I should have one whose eye should attend her remove, lest she should go from me another way, whereby I should know the better what I had to do. When she doth remove and set up and down, then I give her my voice, which she is glad to hear. Having taken her down, I supper, not putting her up any more. My reason for this course so taken is this. When my hawk is in a tree that hath been so long and manned by me, and a longer time been kept in bondage before she come to me, she now begins to know herself, and think of what she hath formerly done for herself. She would get her supper, and it is so late that she seeth nothing whereon to pray, and therefore she shall see the next night. What is in her power to command? You shall not need to bid her go, but she will give you cause of joy to see with what metal and spirit she flieth. No partridge in the world can fly from a good short-winged hawk, and the purr in her springing will make any hawk fly there too. If she have been rightly ordered and in strength, I will advise you once more. Be sure your hawk has all her rights. Let her not have any smack of wildness nor want either weather or water. It is to be understood that I have showed my hawk water within two or three days after she hath been peppered, but it should be at a brook or some other gravelly place, fit for that purpose, holding my fist to the water, and at the end of my lines in my right hand, if she did not bathe at my first or second day, showing her water, but refused it, it should be that she had no desire to bathe, and that when she refused so to do, Wildness or ramishness should not be the cause thereof. If she did jump it to the water, I would have something in my fist ready to show her. When she made show of coming from the water, which would make her ever after, when she had done, look for the fist, where she would dry, prune, and oil herself, and as yet she never had other perch to weather upon than my fist. Neither shall she until she be a true flying hawk. Now for the place where I would first show her a partridge. It should be in a champion, where partridges will surely fly to a hedge. Then my hawk must needs take stand upon a bush in the hedge, for it is great odds that she shall not have it in the foot, and although she be fair behind it, yet she will assuredly go to the place, because the love of the partridge inviteth it, and it is odds that nearer than that she shall have no place fit to go with unto. Well, at the retrove, there is no doubt but she will have it. But say that my hawk either has it in the foot or otherwise, 
that she was so near it that she half was striking at it. If the fall beat it clean through the hedge, and there my hawk sitteth upon the ground, it can prove no worse. If she have it in the foot, we are well pleased. If she sit upon the ground, I stay both men and dogs, for it may be it is not flicked. A hawk that thus showed her mettle will not sit long so, but up unto a bow. Then I ride in quietly. If the partridge be there, it is very lucky. If not, I hold it no ill luck to have so hopeful a young hawk. But I go presently about to please her, having a brown chicken in my bag. The neck I pull in asunder, but break no skin, and tied to my lures or cranes, holding the end in my hand. I throw it out fluttering and thereupon, please her as well as if she had killed a partridge. I do with not tie it to my lures, as fearing her dragging or offering to carry it out of a wild, ramish or any other ill disposition. For I have before this tied a dead fowl to my cranes, and thrown it out unto her, amongst men, dogs, and horses walking about her, and thereon I let her take all her pleasure, but by little bits of warm meat I sup her from my hand, letting her wholly see all that I do, until I see her ready to forsake the quarry to catch my hand, and then I deliver up more covertly until I have her jump to my fist. Where with plumage or tiring, I end her supper. You shall hereafter find a better benefit to many purposes by your dealing with your hawks thus. Thus I reward my hawk upon her partridge, and the commodities thereof exceed their understanding that have not made use thereof. As I have told you that I would choose a champion country wherein to enter my hawk, yet it should be so as that there should be some small hedges. And I always have this consideration that I will well know, that whither I ride there should have been no store of hawking, and then I know they can fly no better than a hand partridge, and they will fly worse at the season than some partridges do that have been well flown to three weeks before Michael Amos. I have ridden out of Essex into Sussex, unto the east part of the downs there, to enter my hawks, where I have not failed to do it, to the great wonder of the worthy knights and gentlemen in those parts, and some right worshipful in the west parts of those downs can witness that in their company I have killed for the most part of a month, together with an intermewed goshawk, eight, nine, or ten partridges in a day. The day of my going thither, and the day of my return to London, was just five weeks, and it was a fortnight or more, in Michael Amos' term, when I came back, I killed in that time with that one hawk, four score and odd partridges, five pheasants, seven rails, and four hares against my will. This is not untrue, for I will present that much honored knight with one of my books, who saw all of this done. And every man know that what we lost some time with fogs and rain, and my going and coming spent four days. I have in the east part shown such hawks as there were never seen the like there, and all of them made in this manner, as I have delivered, if they had fallen in fern, or among some small shrubbed furzies, I would when I came in but hold up my hand, and she would presently be there, or if any man else got in before me, if he did not hold out his fist, she would light up upon his head. Is this not a sweet comfort? for so little pains, if your hawk be followed with flying, as I use mine, you shall have no cause to complain of the short-winged hawk, that if they sit still but one hour they are presently wild, and care not for their keeper. You shall rather have a care to give her ease, setting her still, as I have used mine, upon a low perch and in the greatest assembly, never hooded in the house. And so when she is to weather abroad unhooded, upon a low perch, never putting her in a corner to take weather and ease in, for neither all nor none of my hawks will be diseased, except for purpose foul play be offered, which I hope I shall never meet with. If it hath rained, then ye shall be enforced to set her high, for if she bait to come to you, either when you come to take her up, or otherwise, she shall wet her wings, so as she shall have more need to weather, 
than when she is set out. So near as I can remember, I will admit nothing to my practice. The manner of giving my casting was overhand, without any meat, when I went to bed. Although she had much meat above, it did not hurt. Casting thus given could not hinder the pudding over her meat, nor should lie in her panel with her meat. But after the meat is gone, then cometh the casting that maketh clean, and carrieth away what is left. Thus I do before she is flying, but after she is flying, she will upon every flight take some plumage, and therefore with the bones and feathers of a partridge wing I conclude her supper. I never fail giving her castings, for I can find the perfect or imperfect estate of my hawk no better than by the knowledge of her castings and I think it will give the best instructions to a young beginner even to know the times of feeding his hawk, and so by his diligent observation come to better understanding. I think castings are as strong as natural as meat. For my own part, from the beginning of hawking until after Michael Amos, I have given two castings and received two every day from my hawk, and sometimes three. I must explain myself thus. When I have early in the morning killed a partridge and given my hawk the head and her foot, which I suddenly get again, for if I should give her leave to eat all the heads, I must not fly so often as I do. But so soon as she hath the head, I quickly pull out the heart and break off the wing, and then holding the heart to her and bruising it between my finger and thumb, she receiveth it at three or four bits. I continue my hand still in his place and then cunningly I take up the head, letting her jump to my fist, where she shall plume upon the wing until I have bitten the skull from the brains, and she may have them without bones. But it hath thus fallen out, when I have so early flown my hawks that she hath eaten the head, which I have been willing to let her do, and I have given the heart withal, because there were other hawks to fly, and no great store of partridges by which means it would be long before my turn would be to fly again, and it hath so proved that I have not flown at all, but riding homeward for such is my manner, ever to call my hawk, I set her loose upon a pair of bars, going from her preparing meat for her dinner, when I walked about fifty or three score paces, I gave her my voice, and she made no respect of it, that usually upon my first call would be at my elbow. I stayed and marveled, and because the day was glorious and the time dangerous to tempt a hawk to play with the wanton, I went back, I must confess, in some fear, giving the fairest words I could stay her, lest she should remove. Good hawk, she had no such thought, but when I came near her, she gave me a small casting that she had taken in the morning, and then I gave her another, which she repaid at three o'clock in the afternoon. I have many times, and lately, seen old and such as went for most expert ostringers. When we have had a hawking journey, been afraid to have anything stir in the chamber, for hindering their hawks from casting, and to keep the curtains drawn before the windows, not suffering the least light to appear so near as they can, for that would be another hindrance to their casting. All this while they lay in bed, and give aim, and when they are up, they are driven to seek dark corners wherein to set their hawks until they cast when it were more fit they were in the field to fly i dare not reprove i know they know their own airs i was never yet enforced to stay for my hawks casting neither do you make any doubt if you will follow your hawk with that familiarity as i have followed mine either in the field or in the house carried bare face in either place she will cast, or in any of them, to pull off her hood when she offereth to cast. Not long after my hawk hath cast, I usually give her a little meat. There is nothing but sickness, a bar against all good perfections, or wildness or ramishness, which maketh her stare and look about her, which makes her afraid to perform those duties, which otherwise she would do. The hawk's no better man than so, are many other ways more defective and disorderly than so. Thus much for ordering my hawk with castings for her diet. I have flown a hawk all one season, and never fed 
upon the beft meat I could. She never tasted beef, neither was her feathered meat, but very seldom cold, and to help her better, a night did hardly escape me, but I thrust out the marrow of the wings of either duck, pheasant, partridge, dove, rook, or such like, breaking the bone off at either end, and so with the feather, the cut end off, drive it whole without breaking into a dish of fair water setting my hawk loose upon the table i would give it her between my thumb and forefinger which she would much desire and much joy in and would expect such kindness at my hands the better the meat is less will serve your practice will soon tell you that there is difference between the wing of an old dove and the wing of a young pigeon and so much is the difference between the wings of a dove flying abroad for his food and the dove kept long in a mew for provision although you shall find the one lean you shall find it tender and moist and the dove in the mew although it is to be extremely full of flesh and with his ease and good feed laid with fat upon the neck and under the wing yet this pulled in pieces you shall find it hard and extremely dry now you understand how i made my hawk flying to the field and if you will now suppose her to be truly flying that she will tend up on the dogs for a retrieve for nature will quickly teach her to know what good service the spaniel doth her say by some ill accident i miss a flight the partridge may be run into a coney hole it is in kent a safe and common rescue or the hawk may strike at it in the fall and so the partridge flick in sussex i have seen two flights in one after none lost the partridge would fall upon the hedges were a rod broad in some place very thick and never come to the ground if i say one of these or other such like accident should befall me otherwise i held it very hard matter to miss a flight and although i know if i would let my hawk alone and beat to serve her with one other partridge that she would tend upon the dogs and so kill it i dare do no such thing for i know if i should use her much to that she would fall better in love with my dogs than with me for they answer her attendance with springing a partridge unto her and after a few times so served although for want of partridges they cannot do it yet she will expect it with such desire as that she will neglect my calling her and so in the end prove an ill comer and then want no ill conditions there is no readier way to catch a hen one fault begetteth another if she should in this following the dogs light upon a hen get some in your company to run and catch her by the legs letting the hen go if you have none in your company that you can do it handsomely do it yourself in such a manner and then setting her down upon some convenient place call her and give her some meat and plumage and so she will be well reconciled and not at all the more unfit to fly again now i have my hawk at this pass i desire to go to the covet if the covert be large i put up my hawk not making question but will draw the dogs after although i should stand still the field hath taught her that if i serve her not a quarter or half an hour i take her to my fist and give her something and then i put her up again and this better is my hawk's condition but if i should with vain hope let her still draw and not serve her i fear very hunger will make her look out to save her life the hawk is not herein to be blamed for extreme hunger will make her keeper forget himself i pray you note hereby and by what i have formerly said that your voice be it high or low neither your action in the covert is that she looketh for for she will give diligent attendance unto the dogs if i spring a pheasant i cannot in the covert have my dogs at that command i have them in the field let me make all the haste i can after my hawk i might miss of the quick finding her if by my dogs questing i were not drawn where she is it is ten to one she will not hunt for it upon the ground if she should it will teach her wit but it is more likely that she will if the covert with broom or furzes be not thick in the bottom but that she may see it she will as it runneth tend it flying over it 
from tree to tree, and when the dogs doth spring it, she is so over it as that it will never rise to go from a high perch. If it should take the hawk, would have it before it come there. And I then falling amongst the dogs, they strive who is most worthy. All this is quickly done, and before the falconer can get into them, it may be you shall find your hawk to enjoy it, if it be with some contention all the better for my hawk, for it will forbid her not to be too hot of a pheasant upon the ground, and you shall with your practice find the profit of it as I have done. For in the killing of more pheasants than I will name, and I think in seven years hawking to the covet, I have never had cause to cry. Here, retire. For if my hawk hath it not in the foot of the first flight, when I know my dogs will not meddle with it, then I shall, before I can get to them assuredly, hear a bay and my hawk over the head of it. When having been well flown, the fear of the hawk maketh the pheasant sit fast. And I as hawk would be hotter, and it may strike at it, and miss it, and so strike herself under the pheasant. And then if the pheasant goeth upon that advantage, it is lost without great luck. Your raymond hawk will not often lose a pheasant thus. She partly forbeareth, because the dogs are so hotly baying, and it may be she hath met with some rough dealing amongst them before, but she will so tend it as that she will challenge it for her master. And I have ever had such success with such hawks as what with their true flying and diligent attendance of the retrieve. I should at seldom find the pheasant but so high as that I might take it down with my hand, or else shake it down with my arms, which done, I would go to a convenient place whether my hawk would diligently wait upon me, and there holding it by the legs, I should soon have my hawk upon the body, but I would cleanly put her to the head, covering the body with my hat or glove. I would not stick to please her well. Notwithstanding, some men's opinions are that if they be well rewarded and kindly pleased upon a pheasant, they will forbear the true stiving partridge. I know not whether my discretion has so prevailed with my hawks, or their own good dispositions have wrought such understanding in them, but assuredly I never had hawk that I have had the handling of from the beginning, but they have loved the partridge much better than the pheasant. It may be a wonder to some why I desire not to have my hawks take a pheasant from the perch, and further wondered at why I should allow of some contention between my hawk and dogs. I understand that generally all dogs are hotter in the covert than in the field and I may meet with dogs, that if she should not be coy of them, they would endanger her life, especially if she should catch a hare, and so might my own dogs do against their will. I have seen a pheasant, when the hawk hath come to strike at him at the perch, chop to another bow with such ill, as that he hath gotten a long bow between him and the hawk, and with his cunning removes beat the hawk out of breath, and in all this conflict would strive to get above the hawk and when he hath had his advantage go proudly away and leave the hawk out of breath and unable to fall it may likewise be said that i am too peremptory in my opinion in pursuing my hawk shall kill the first partridge for my opinion in the covert having my hawk so familiar made as that in the field she is well pleased with my loving dealing with her and will attend my coming into her not fearing anything so i be by her so would I have her in the covert wholly to rely upon me, and be confident that when I shall come unto her, she shall have her desire satisfied. She will soon understand thus much, with using her in such a manner as I have foretold. And as for my hawk, I am most confident in her entering herself. She hath no way been weakened. She is familiar, strong, and able, and I know nature hath taught her to do the best she can. You have been formally told how and where I would enter my hawk at, at partridges that have not been flown at, and in fair flying. I advise you what to do by telling you what I have done. I was entered to fly at a goshawk of my neighbors, and I would not kill a partridge, nor had killed one that year. I flew her to the covert, where I so encouraged my hawk, as that winter she proved a good partridger. This approveth that the flying to the covert doth not hinder a hawk's metal in the field. I did not know Sir Edward Soliard 
a knight of high eftimation in that art, as well as otherwife for his worthy difpofition, fry a foolifh gauze hawk at blackbird and thrush, and he was glad, when he had gotten her to that perfection, to beat it into a hedge or bush. He did it to make her know that she had a commanding power over fowl. If she would put herself to it, she proved a very good hawk. I know many will say they have had hawks, that if they had once seen a pheasant, that then they would kill no more partridges that year. It is very like there have been many such. And as I confess that, so I pray you give me leave to think that the fault was not in them, but in the unskillfulness of their keeper. Some men, so soon as their hawks give up a partridge, do presently work upon them with scourings, and then pinch them, and shorten their diet, by which means they are unable to kill a partridge, or thereby their courage is so taken from them that they will not show what they are able to do. I would advise you herein, but all is in the practice and handling. I will tell you my course. If I meet with such a hog, and my reason for it, contrary to most men's opinions, I set up my rest that in ten days I will fly my hawk no more, but I will strive with all the art I have to bring her to as much courage and strength as ever she had with good meat and some other devices I would practice upon her, wherewith you shall meet amongst my receipts set forth for cures. I would now have more care in making this hawk, for it is credit to make of a buzzard a good hawk. It is not my meat and diet I give her, must alone affect this in my hawk, but a diligent care over her for other wants, as mating, bathing, and weathering, all special means to make a hawk joy in herself, and she shall bait as little as I can for weakening her. When I have brought my hawk to such perfection, I dare promise to myself she shall then do as well and better than ever she did. Although I have been tedious, and at large set down my manner of practicing with the sore ramish hawk, yet I do not think there is anything set down, but some will be content to have the reading thereof, and let me deliver this as my last request. When you have made a perfect good hawk, let her not be neglected, but keep her so. The keeping is much easier than the making her so. I assure you in all my proceedings, from the first to the last with my hawk, I never found it painful, but the comforts I had of good conclusion fed me with sweet contentment and pleasure. I now follow with that I show how to reclaim any short-winged hawk from any evil condition. End of First Treaty Second Treaty of Burt's Treaty of Hawks and Hawking by Edmund Burt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Second Treaty, wherein the Ostringer is taught to reclaim his hawk from any ill condition. Chapter 1. How to make a hawk hood well, that will not abide the sight of the hood, but bite at it, and with her feet strike at thy hand and hood. Bait, shriek, hang by the heels, and will not stand upon the fist and this shall be done within forty-eight hours, with less than forty baits. The greatest motive that set my thoughts work to find out a secret, whereby a hawk should be brought to like of that which she did most detestably hate, was that in my hearing it, hath been often and many times said by many gentlemen, of which some would say they would give forty shillings, some would give five pounds, and some other would give ten pounds, that their hawk would hood well. Many experiments I tried, wherewith I could have hooded such a hawk well, which I will not publish, because they brought as much ill to the hawk in some other kind, as the well hooding should profit them. At length I thought of feeding a hawk through the hood, cutting the hole for a beak very wide. It is but the marring of a hood. I would have the hole so wide as when I did hold it by the tassel, she should not very easily, when it was laid upon the meat, feed through it. I would continue feeding her so three or four days, never offering in all that time to put it on. 
But now that she hath grown familiar with the hood, all fear thereof forgotten, which she would show by her bold feeding therein, and that she should make no show of disliking my putting it over the meat, and my taking it back. When I found her thus securely feeding, and her head in the hood, I would then gently and lightly raise my hand, a very small motion will serve, and so leave the hood upon her head. Take heed you give her no dislike by the sudden putting it on, and by the too high raising your hand in this beginning with her, and have as great care that she may be thoroughly emboldened with the hood before you offer to put it on. With this practice, putting on her hood and pulling it off, oftentimes in her feeding, you shall effect her taking the hood to your desire. Provided always your practice be with patience and leisure, for if you shall pop it on suddenly and with haste, you may thereby put her in mind that thereby she took her first offense. You cannot wrong her by any other means. Remember also to leave her with the hood upon her head when she is feeding. This I did privately deliver to some of my friends by word of mouth above twenty years since, and some did carefully follow my direction and did not fail but brought their hawks to such perfection as when she was most discontented with a stump of a partridge wing, he would readily hood her. Others whose patience could not endure the time, whilst they were thoroughly emboldened with the hood, would feed securely and gently in it, would be offering to put it on, and then what through her fear and his hasty carrying his hand, which increased her fear, brought her to that pass that she would not feed any more through the hood, but with such a caudal fear as that she would not be hooded, but was then ill as ever she was, and so much worse, because he had now bobbed her with this trick, whereby she might have been taught. Swam big with desire to effect this by some more ready and easy means, which might more speedily be done and truly performed i had an imagination of this course which here i will deliver by which means i brought five hawks and tarsals to as good perfection as i could desire in the time of keeping my house in chamber being at that time very weak and all of them were as much disordered as hawks could be and i delivered them as gently hooding as could be desired after they came into me and that I had bestowed them upon the fist of one of my people, I kept them upon the fist. That day they came unto me, and that night they were truly watched, after the former manner of watching my hawks, both man and hawk, to walk, or at the least the hawk to walk. So soon as it was fair and light, I did mail them up in a handkerchief. I pray you understand thus much, that is not good she should be fed before she be mailed, making it very close about the shoulders and body. I would not mail up the tops of her flying feathers, lest I should thereby mar the web of the feather. Her legs they were laid along under her train, but to save her train from breaking any feather, because her legs and it must be tied together, I plait a large handkerchief six times double and lay that upon her legs under her train by which means, by binding her up, you cannot bruise or crack a feather. There is nothing but all safety in this course. My hawk thus mailed up, I lay her upon a cushion, and carry her up and down under my arm. She is now fast, she cannot rebel. I offer the hood, whereat, although she strike and strive to stir, she cannot. So soon as she is quiet, holding the hood by the tassel, I gently put it on. She cannot forbid it. Thus I follow her, hooding and unhooding. I lay her upon a table. I walk by her. I put it on and pull it off very often. And if I shall be made acquainted with anything that she shall not endure, I will then present her with that. Say she will not abide the fire, or not the blowing or stirring thereof. I walk up and down before the fire, which she should here blow and see it stirred and rattled together 
she cannot bait nor hurt herself. And when she shall patiently lie still, and find that it doth not hurt her, she will be the less afraid thereof. And in all this time I lose nothing about my other practice. It may be she is coy and fearful of dogs. I lay her upon the ground with her cushion, where she shall for that time have familiarity enough with them. Lying so, walking by her, I ply her with a hood, and so I continue until night. When night cometh, I unmail her. I have had a hawk thus mailed, that in a winter's day she hath not made a mute. Admit she doth not mute. It is great odds she shall. She foweth none but a few of her small feathers about her tool, which are presently washed with a sponge without any hurt. When she is now unmailed and sitteth upon my fist, she will take the hood by candlelight, as well as she did when she was mailed, which it may be she would do before she came into me, for many hawks will hood by candlelight that will not abide the sight of it in the day. But for your better instruction, it must be with holding it gently by her beak, which she must be as willing to put into the hood as you are to put it on. I pray you let your own reason guide you thus far. Hastiness to hood her when she would not be hooded brought her to this imperfection. Therefore keep you as far from that as may be, and in this practice to do it with as much leisure as may be. It is not to be believed how the least hasty motion will put her in mind of what she had formerly met with. I watched her this night with often using the hood, and whether it did sit still or walk, I would be sure she should not be idle. Believe it, all this night she will take the hood, as well as you can desire, but the question is for the morning. Therefore I would be without fail walking abroad in the morning before day, and then and there follow my practice, when it may be I shall not find him contrary my desire. As I feed often in the night, so now I fail not, lest hunger should make him stir. If he be not coy of the hood at all or a little before the sun rises, if they be carefully handled, they are forever made well hooding. I never had any but one tarsal, but with the night and day before were made very gentle to the hood. Only that one tarsal I was driven to mail up again the second day. I must let none of them all have their full rest that night. But when they are thus made, they must be followed, for fear they fall again. Be sure to be abroad early in the morning, following her with the hood. I hope this is sensibly to be affected by any man. But if my hawk turn her head from the hood, I patiently attend her by patience, holding my hood to her head, and with the turning my hand, set her right and sit to take it. But if she will be wild or angry, she cannot understand me. He that will use violence with a horse, already distempered, and with spur or chain, add fury to fury, may perhaps at that time be deceived of his expectation. So he that shall deal with a man in the time of his impatience may peradventure at that time want of reasonable hearing. But give the man time until that humor be spent, and so thy horse and hawk, and they will all mildly attend thee. If your hawk be distempered, and you know no reason why, use her not otherwise, but with a loving respect, and as soon as may be, make a peaceable love and reconcilement between you. There is no indifferent hooding to be looked for by this manner, of using her, for she must do it well with the highest degree. Hereof I conclude, and so I proceed to the recovery of all other ill conditions, and first for a hawk that will royal and house. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 How to bring a hawk that will royal and seek for poultry at a house to good perfection and staidness, and how to get that hawk love in whom an ill keeper hath bred such carelessness. If a man should deliver among many Austrians, and such that would scorn that any man should exceed them in knowledge, that there were a man that would 
and could recover a hawk to good perfection, that were plentifully furnished with all faults, and wanted no ill condition, I know they would laugh at him, and say it were a lie, and impossible. But I avouch it, and am warranted through my practiced experience, not to blush or care for what they say. But this I advise them that stand affected to company and good fellowship, to have care how to order their hawks. For now their masters shall find that diligence will affect anything, and not using careful diligence, there is no good to be gotten at their hawks' hands. But now, to make proof of my art, and for thy instruction, good friend, you are to know, you are to deal with hawks that have been ill-handled, and not to begin with them as with hawks from the cage. For she will royal in house, which at the first did come by her not coming, and her not coming was want of love to her keeper. For if she had so loved her keeper, as that she would have come to him, he had been out of his wits, if he would have let her alone to royal and house. I cannot otherwise think that having this fault, but she is withal wild and ramish, which might be a second means to make her travel in this sort. Therefore, your first course must be by watching and manning to make her very gentle and familiar, and in that time you must labor to get her a good stomach. It is not short meals alone breed a hungry desire in your hawk, but continual carriage, castings, and often a cleanly feeding, with clean and light meat drawn through water, but after drier meat, for if the hawk shall be fat and in grease, when she doth come unto thee, your care must be the more for her diet. For if she want meat wherewith to carry away her grease, the breaking of her grease will take away from her stomach, and her grease too fast broken, and will not only make her sickly, but truly sick, and kill her, or breed diseases such as she had as could be dead. Therefore let her not fast, nor do not overfeed, which fault is as dangerous as fasting. For with her meat in her mutes, she will spend more grease then she can bring up with her casting. Her grease gone, and your hawk made gentle. Your hawk will quickly show a good stomach. Let not your hasty desire hinder your good conclusion herein. When your hawk has come to a good stomach and perfect gentleness, as I did reclaim my sore ramish hawk, calling her to the fist out of the hood from the fist of another man, in manner as the long-winged hawk is lured, you must observe the same course, only differing herein, for you must call her to a catch or lure, and thereunto take her as the long-winged hawk is used, wherewith thou must make her much in love with thy sweet and mild using her, and in doing thus it will make her love thee better than ever she loved house. Let her please herself unto the catch, offer not to meddle with it, but let her freely and peaceably enjoy it and when she is pluming upon it, feed her with bits of good meat from thy hand. It will make her look for that sweetness not only then when she is upon the catch, but it will likewise make her love thee when she is upon the quarry. If thou shalt ply her thus with thy hand, it will bring her to such a pass as she will readily jump to your fish from the catch, and the sweet and often using hereof will make her leave the quarry in such manner, and so preserve her feathers from wetting. At the first beginning of calling her, I hope your understanding will advise you to have her in cranes, wherewith, if she would check, she shall be prevented, and wherewith she shall be stayed if she offer to drag or carry the catch. For the want of love to her former keeper could not but breed these as well as other ill conditions. But I hope your gentle using and manning her before you did ever show catch or lure, hath freed her from these. And now your kind dealing with your hawk, feeding her so from thy hand unto the catch, will give her such contentment that never met with such content before, as that I am persuaded she will be made thereby more truly loving unto thee than a hawk shall be made, bought from the cage. 
I pray, let us admit that she was a good conditioned hawk once, and would come to the fist very familiarly. How should she then lose this by her keeper's negligence, being not often or seldom called, and then upon her coming slightly rewarded, supposing if he should give her any meat, it would hinder her well flying, which might fall out to be presently, but such rewarded as would please her, would work no such ill effect. And now thou hast her most readily coming to the catch, if thou wilt handle her with no better respect, but only caring how for that present to get her to your fist, and thereby please yourself, and not at all her. She will be wary of it, and such usage and fall to her old trade, which, being handled as I have directed, I would not doubt but to put her up amongst hens, when at any hour in the day she should leave them all for love of me and the catch, which asketh no longer time than throwing it out, which I would use her unto every hour if I were not sure of my flight. And this I hope will suffice for this, but if you will have me grant that which I cannot yield unto, that having flown a partridge to a house, notwithstanding all these kind courses taken with her, she hath caught a hen, then let someone in the company that can tell how to do it make haste into her, taking up both hawk and hen, and run to a pond or pit of water. There is no dwelling house inhabited, and where hens are, but you shall find some water. And there in two over her head and tail wash them both together three or four times. Then having the hawk upon the fist, let not her keeper show himself until he hath her hath her with lines fastened or calling cranes into her. Then I would advise her keeper to give her his voice out of her sight, let the hawk to be still held, although she doth make a bait to go to him. He is to give his voice but once or twice, and that is where she seeth him not. After when he cometh near her, let him give her his voice cheerfully, and let her in cranes, be let go to him. When he throweth out the catch and cranes, lest being wet, she should desire to fly to a tree to weather and dry herself. Her cranes forbid it. Now you must not think she hath committed a fault, for she hath done penance for it. And coming to you, she looketh to be much made of. Satisfy her expectations, giving her all the contentment you may. It is not possible there should be a hawk so ill, but by this means she will be recovered. It may be some young professor in this art has professed that if his hawk be very hungry and sharp, she will the sooner come unto him. He is herein much deceived, for unless she loveth him very well, hunger is a special means that draweth her from him, for hunger must be satisfied, and her little love to him will make her the better pleased with that she provided for herself, and make her look out for her own provision. But if she be truly loving him, then there is no doubt but she would come the readier. Mark then, if this be not the only main point, for an Austringer to have his hawk in love with him. There may be many that will never affect my doctrine, because my course here and set down is painful. But what is anything worth that is not easily gotten. But he is deceived that holdeth it painful. For his hawk once well made, she will not ask half the pains or attendance in the time of her flying as other hawks, that are but half or half made hawks, must be followed with. Whensoever thou callest thy hawk, give her some reward upon the catch, and likewise please her upon the fist. If I may be so bold without reprehension, for my recreation, to think of a more worthy delight, I will rest thankful. I will speak of the horseman and his horse, the ostringer and his hawk. Always understand that I acknowledge the one to exceed the other as much as gold exceedeth dross. But what I intend is this. Both horse and hawk are as they are taught. If a horse prove hard mouth, a runaway, carry an unsteady head, his neck awry or his body uneven, 
nay sometimes he may and will refuse to turn of the one hand and some other time dislike some part of the ground wherein he is ridden and there will fly out or perhaps stop of his forefeet without either rucking behind or advancing before until after his stop and other such vices can it be said that that horse hath gotten such a fault or faults otherwise than through the unskillfulness of his rider when the true artist is not only able to amend these faults but in some parts to amend what nature hath made defective the hawk is seldom seen to have any natural defect and therefore asketh no such art neither do i question the shapes of horses or hawks for in both kinds their shapes much differ but what i write is for the manner of their making for the ill shape of either of them cannot excuse their ill conditions the worst you can say by a hawk for their shape is that she is a long and slender besom tailed hawk i say all feathers fly as horses of several races are of lighter quicker or duller disposition so are your hawks out of some country or airy of much more spirit and metal than the other and will last shorter or longer time in making but for their vicious making therein resteth the comparison if the hawk will not come or not abide company or a stranger in the company perhaps not a woman a basket a horse or cart or a royal or house or any of these vices can the ostringer have a less imputation laid upon him than the ill-ridden horse hath given his rider which is he was ignorant and wanted knowledge alas simple ostringer how shallow is thy art in respect of horsemanship and so much the more art thou worthy of blame the excellent horseman will make and show his horse without any vice and so will take the exquisite ostringer show his hawk without any ill condition in every trade wherein a man is most exercised he is most excellent then strive and labor to exceed them in some measure that have little skill for the ordinary handicraftsman passes by with less than ordinary or no respect when the skillful is desired and much sought after who understandeth not that the love of one hawk is more readily gotten than the love of another and that is not so easy to get the love of a hawk that hath been dealt with and bobbed as to have it from a hawk that hath not been dealt with and therefore in your practice have patience and never think she doth well until she be wholly at your command thy pains will be answered with pleasure work out the week and sunday will be holy day i will now proceed and examine what other ill quality a hawk may have there is an excellent hawk and will fly and kill a partridge very well but she will carry it from her keeper when he cometh in the remedy end of chapter two chapter three how to stay that hawk that having killed a partridge will very unwillingly suffer her keeper to come unto her but will carry it he was an unkind keeper and handled his hawk very ill so to get her hatred from whom but through love he could not hope to receive any good otherwise he was very unskillful to fly his hawk so wild and so ill-mannered for one of these must be the cause then by working the contrary in her she is faultless and will fly the better if she will come well then it is not merely out of the dislike of her keeper and so much the sooner brought to good perfection but it may be partly so and partly wildness and ramishness and there may be a third dislike which stronglier possesses her than any of the other which presently shall be delivered unto you before a hawk be truly manned and made gentle she will never learn good or leave bad conditions for so long as she is wild she is altogether angry forward unruly and disorderly therefore be sure to use such patience and gentleness as that she may understand thee then put her in cranes and set her upon some man's fist have a dead dove or some other fowl it matters not although you stand not above twenty or thirty paces from her 
giving your voice as though you would call her. Throw the fowl as far from you as you can, which when she hath in her foot and doth offer to carry, which the cranes forbid, then know that it is not wildness or ramishness. For before this, with carriage, in company thou hadst made her gentle, neither can it be that she feareth thee, for thou hast labored before this to a better purpose. If you have not, I have set down my directions in vain. If then you have so carefully manned her, as that she neither fears you nor is in fear of any man else, yet it is fear that causeth this not fearing thee, but she feareth a quarry shall be taken from her by thee, and she would be glad to give herself a better reward thereupon than you will allow of, and the small rewards you have given her, when you have taken her from the quarry, hath bred this fault. But this fault showeth the hawk hath metal and spirit enough. Well, now that she is upon the catch, and so long as she stands still, fearing she know not what, stand you still, not offering to go nearer than you are, until she shall be busily pluming, holding the cranes fast, and continually giving her your voice. When she falls to plume, walk gently to her, still giving her your voice. And whereas her fear was the quarry should be taken from her, let her find altogether the contrary. Let her enjoy it, and take this course, whereby you shall soon win her favor, that at any other time she will not only give you leave, but lovingly expect your coming into her, having readiness for supper or breakfast, or at any or every time of the day, such meat as is warm and good. Her taste is very good, although it cannot compare with her sight. Feed her therewith by little bits out of your hand. If she look at you for more, for bearing what is in her foot, then do you for bear to give any more until she fall again to plume. Then give her your voice and feed her so again. If you will do thus, you shall find her look as earnestly at your hand for reward as a hungry Spaniard will look for a crust when she will be so pleased with your voice as when she hath a partridge in her foot. She will diligently attend and stay your coming when I think hereby you are well taught how to use her. And now for this fault I may conclude and inquire what other fault may disgrace a hawk. She will carry it to a tree. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 To Reclaim a Hawk That Will Carry a Partridge Into a Tree It is so lately set down how to stay a hawk and make her lovingly expect your coming into her as it is fresh in memory. Your hawk being brought to that pass, this fault will soon be left. I have approved it. So soon as your hawk has gone into the tree, get all the company to go under her using as fearful noise as they can, showing hats and gloves, which will soon make her remove, but it may be to another tree. Follow her again with a like noise. There is no doubt but it will remove her. If not, they must use some more violent means, as striking the tree with sticks or throwing cudgels up. She may peradventure remove twice or thrice before she come to the ground. But so soon as she has come to the ground, whereof, ye shall not have so great cause of joy, but she will joy more to hear your loving voice, which I would then have you freely and familiarly give, when she will soon understand she shall enjoy what she hath with sweet content and quiet. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 For a hawk that so soon as she hath caught a partridge will take and gorge herself upon it. The cause of a grief known the disease is soon cured, and so it must be inquired how she came by this foul fault, and then it is soon remedied. I cannot understand it should be any otherwise than thus. At the first, when she has caught a partridge, and before you come unto her, had begun to feed, and peradventure feed so much as you feared, it would hinder your whole day's sport. It could not but move some passion in you which should have dissembled. But it could not be with some impatience you take her from the quarry, 
not suffering her to eat any more, which now at the first she did fall into by chance, but now she hath found the sweet thereof, and the wrong you offered her in so sudden taking her up will make her the next time more earnestly and with more haste to feed, remembering how she was taken from it before, lest she now be so served again. The best remedy is this, when she should fly to the next partridge and kill, if you come in unto her before she break, it may be she catch it near you at the retrove. Let her alone with it, and feed her with your hand. She is sitting upon it, as I taught you before. If by chance she happen of a bare place, be not discontented, but ply her with giving her meat from your hand, and let her eat in such abundance until she doth forbear to eat any more. It shall not be amiss when you have put on her lines to pine her down at length, and whether she hath it in a ditch, bush, or hedge, neither reward her nor any other hawk until you have her in the plain, and that will make them so soon as they have a partridge get out with it into the plain. Then if she bait upon the extraordinary occasion, she shall not go away gorged. You must not now be sparring of your labor, for if you spend three or four hours in thus feeding her, she will not be so long in feeding. Yet with a partridge in her foot, whereon, although she will not feed, she will be unwilling to part from, let her enjoy it, and be often offering her meat. When you find that she is careless of the quarry, take her to your fist. It may be in your first entering, you are too sparing in your reward. But howsoever she cometh by this, in following this practice but twice or thrice, you shall with kind handling her in her rewards, which should be much from the hand, you shall have her handle a partridge, as that you may at any time take a live partridge out of her foot to enter one with all. And thus I conclude for this, unless you will say she hath almost eaten the partridge before you come to her, I say let her eat, and feed her still with the most provocation you can. No doubt it will make her very choice how she feeds after she hath been so overfed, and after she hath been twice or thrice so dealt with take leisure. A hawk loveth her keeper very well. She will draw after him and come at his pleasure. She will, in her drawing, be still upon the head of the dogs. But when she hath killed it, will carry very foully. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6. How to use that hawk that will carry for fear of the dogs. I must herein suppose that she will draw after the dogs, or otherwise after her keeper. But so soon as she hath the partridge, as soon as the dogs come to her, she carrieth away the quarry. This can be but to the next hole to hide herself. But then if the dogs shall follow her thither, and thrust her out from thence, herein the hawk is not to be blamed but the spaniels that better deserve a halter than a crust. It must, he thought, upon how she came to be thus fearful of the spaniels. It could not be in the field, because the falconer shall be at the retrieve, and then he is only to be blamed, that hath not taught his spaniels better. If by neither of these, then this must be gotten by very foul dogs in the covert, where if the spaniels be but a little hot in their sport, it teacheth the hawk more wit than knavery. For as I have partly said before, she will not be too hot upon the game for fear of them, but will trust to my help and will tend it so as that she will not lose it, so that I shall be sure to have it by my own catching. I reap this benefit by her fear, that she will not strike at the pheasant upon the ground, for if she should so do, it is great odds but so she misseth it. And if it then bringeth, it is more odds, but it is clean lost. But if she tend it, and the dogs, as I have foresaid, it is great odds, but it goeth to the perch, from whence it is likely it will never fly, but by my hands is to be delivered to her. I do not, as I have seen some do, toss it up high, that thereby she shall catch it, and so fall among the dogs which, as they say, doth embolden her upon the dogs. 
It must be there so, because she knoweth she is not able to carry it from them. But when she is in the field, and hath a lighter matter in her foot, it may then work a worse effect. In having field room and sight whether to carry it in safety, she will remove. The discommodities that I have met with in having my hawk take a pheasant from perch, some I have before set down in the seventh chapter, and this is another. Many times she hangeth on one side of the bow, in having fast hold upon the pheasant, and the pheasant upon the other. Whether your hawk receiveth hurt hereby, or no judge you, and the like mischief must needs befall, when a pheasant is tossed high into her, for when she catcheth it so high, she will not fall plumed down therewith, but will a little strive to show her strength, and then the pheasant hitting a bow, never so little, although the twig may be very little, if the hawk letteth it not go, she must needs hang as before. I desire not to make my hawk hot in the covert. My reasons before expressed may suffice, but these inconveniencies may advise other men how to deal in this case. But in my practice I am sure there is no inconvenience by carrying it into the plain, and there to serve her as I used my ramish hawk. I am well assured that thereby I make my hawk as truly to love me as a hawk can possibly love a man, and this benefit thou shalt find it work in thee hawk that will carry. It will make her so to love thee and to assure herself in thee that if she doth carry a pigeon for fear of the dogs, yet hearing thy voice, she will be so confident and secure in thee as she will stir no more, for she knows she shall have her reward with quietness. If your spaniels will not leave to follow her, but be more ready to beat her out of the country than otherwise, if you will not part from them, God send him sorrow that loveth it. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 How to use a hawk that will carry a partridge into a tree, and will not be driven to the ground, but there will assuredly eat it. There is no hawk trained as I have done mine, and as I have taught to use yours, will suffer such a vice to take hold of her, but I must not stand upon. If she had been thus or thus dealt with, this would never have been, but now we must seek to amend it, and say she doth it neither for fear of man nor dog, but out of natural disposition and accustomed practice, let her be short-coped, so I would advise all short-winged hawks to be used. For the safety of thine own hands, it may be objected, how shall she then hold a pheasant? How have my hawks done that would hardly miss a pheasant, and all of them short-coped? I will now deliver a truth, for the affirming whereof I am willing to take my oath. I had a tarsal of a goshawk, that one after another, let two pheasants slip out of his foot. I was thereat much perplexed. I found many of their feathers, but neither of their bodies. Standing with my hawk upon my fist, not knowing what to do, whether I should fly any more or no, the wood was large, but the growth of two or three years, as I stood still, a cock did spring very near me. My hawk did neither suddenly nor earnestly bait at him, yet when he did bait, I did let him fly, when he showed he never meant to catch it, but flew to mark, and I saw him dart up into a spear, I made haste into him. I did spring the pheasant just under him. He turned upon his stand, and then flew after, not losing any ground on him, but when he planed to fall, he caught him by the head, and did hang almost a yard from the ground. I came to him, laid him in the plain, and covered his body. So he had as much pleasure, as good as reward as I could give him, upon the head and neck. After this, I assure you, in all the time I kept him, and in the killing of very many pheasants, which then were very plentiful, he never made me a retrove, but would most assuredly have him by the head at the fall, when the pheasant would lie stretched out at length and never stir feather. If when I had drawn a covert, a pheasant had gone to perch, he would come and sit near him, but not in that tree, 
put him out, you would take an order with him. He should never fall more, but when he had him by the head. It hath been said that he killed one old cock that had been beaten by an excellent goshawk of old Sir Robert Roth and Master Rainford's hawk. I could never meet with any pheasant that ever served me so, and I deliver upon this hearsay. Now your hawk is thus coped. Take a leather in all points fashioned like a bewit. Put it about her hand her talent, and then button it to her bewit, whereon her bell hangeth and it will so hold up her talent that she cannot at all grip with it. Then she cannot sit upon a bow, hold a partridge, and feed. For a plainer demonstration, make your leather in all points like your bewit. For the length that you must make fit to hold up her talent in such places as you shall see cause, I advise you make it not too short, lest it should hinder her trussing a partridge, and so be discomfited cut a little slit in the midst of it or near the button then the mist as you do in the leather wherewith you couple your spaniels and as you fasten that about the ring of your couples so fasten that about the talent of your hawk and so fastened button it about the boet as you button the couples about the spaniel's neck herein you are satisfied let us now inquire for more ill properties end of chapter seven Chapter 8. How to Reclaim a Hawk that will neither abide horsemen, strangers, carts, footmen, or women, or such like. Let it be inquired how she came by this coyness, and why she would not endure all these, or any of these, as well as other hawks. There can be nothing said for it, but that she hath not been well and orderly manned. Then it should appear that well and orderly manning them should make them familiarly endure these or any of these and so it will but now it must be done by other means you well understand the courses i have used in manning my hawks it was truly practiced upon them there shall no ill condition follow them but when a hawk is but half made then she falls from bad to worse but so she is harder by much to be reclaimed than she was at the beginning and will ask more tendance and respective care to hold her well at the second making, and then a cast of hawks well made in their first handling. Before you begin to practice upon her, let her be watched and carried a day or two. When you have done so, if she have a good stomach, you may the sooner begin with her, and yet she may have a good stomach, but ramishness will suffer her to show it. But there is nothing to be done with such a hawk, until by watching and manning she be brought to patience, which done, begin thus. Find out some place where there is some great assembly, either at bowls or some such other exercise, and having her in cranes, set her upon some man's fist, and let her jump to a catch, and thereupon dandle the time with her. This must be done many days and many times in the day i would be near some market town where upon a market day i would find some convenient place where women with their baskets horses with loads upon them carts with their carriage variety of colored horses and passengers by in diverse places should come by her there i would be sure to spend the whole day in playing with her in such manner upon the catch if you will ask me how long she will be in making familiar with all these things i say you will never do it if so soon as you have ended your practice you go and set her down to grow wilder and be the second day as ill as she was at the first but in the continuance hereof three or four days and thy careful attendance over her day and night will greatly prevail with her I would not doubt but to make such a hawk with my diligence and pain, using her as I have herein taught you, to sit upon the pelt in the marketplace, nor fearing nor caring for anything, a sidua stilla faxum exuat. Hath not God made all creatures? 
Have not wild stags by watching and manning been driven like cattle upon the way? What is it that man cannot effect, if he will thereunto apply himself? If one day will not serve the turn, take two, if not two, then ten, and twenty more, but I would have my travel satisfied with a sweet conclusion. There is something else to be thought upon, and therefore I will proceed. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 What course is to be taken with a hawk that hath flown a partridge will continually sit upon the ground at mark, and thereby is likely to beat out herself from her true flying by missing of many flights. A special care is to be had herein how you fly your hawk, which must be as the country is where you fly your hawk. As thus, if it be in the champion, then you must let her fly far from the partridges. There she cannot lose sight of them. And yet it may be she shall not see the fall so well, but being far from behind, if she be in strength and courage, shoot up to a tree, for she is more than a dull-spirited hawk. And I think there is not such a hawk will fly home a partridge, but she will stir or hunt for it if she be near at the fall, or soon learn to go to a tree, which I said before I would have you prevent, by flying far from the game, when she shall not be enticed by being near to them, to fall upon the ground. If this please you not, go hawk in the woodland, and make choice to fly at such partridges as will fly to a wood. Here your course must be, not as you did in the champion, but to fly as near them as may be, for fear if she should be far behind, she should lose sight of them. But being near, they then tempt her to fall into the wood upon the ground, and let her set and hunt until she be wearing of so doing. Be careful not to suffer a dog to go unto her, neither let her hear your voice at all. At length she will find that there is no good to be gotten by walking, and then she will up to a tree. Now your own knowledge assureth you that out of the wood the partridges will not slick, and that putting your dogs into the wood you shall be sure to show her a flight. Wherewith, if she fall again, I would not without question, let her alone until she would wish she had her supper. If in the woodland, you shall sometime make her draw after you, and serve her with the spaniels. It will do her good, but the general practice will very quickly work wit in her. And thus, much for this, having a little spoken of it before. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 That the tarsal is more prone to these ill conditions than the hawk, and how to reclaim him that will seek out for a dove-house, with which fault I never knew goshawk tainted. All of my proceeding and direction hath been wholly intended for the reclaiming and making the hawk, which is all one for the tarsal, who is to be practiced upon for such faults, in the same manner as in a goshawk. But there is one vile quality that I have heard a tarsal would often practice, wherewith I never yet knew goshawk tainted, and whereunto a tarsal would never fall if he be handled in that form that I have set down. Some tarsal after a haggardly or ramish disposition will, will upon the missing of a flight not stay at mark ere coming to serve him. Some other will sit fast until some stranger show himself, and then he is gone. These qualities follow ill-manned hawks as well as the tarsal. This is nothing but wildness. Want of true manning brought him into this, and he is of this fault to be reformed, as is the hawk, by feeding often and many times in the day amongst the multitude of people and cranes upon a catch, where you must make a true practice with feeding him from the hand. It may be said he will kill himself before he will be quiet in such an assembly. He must be then watched and carried, barefaced, until he be so gentle as that he will endure all company, and then upon the catch thou shalt make him so in love with thee, with thus using him upon it, as I have formerly set down, 
that he will endure all things whatsoever. I have heard, but I think it was more than truth, that a tarsal roiled from the mark and was that night taken in a dove house, earnestly feeding upon a dove, twenty miles from the place whence he was flown. It is beyond all understanding that loving and knowing a dove house well, as he did, he should travel so far before he should find one should please him. And this should be in a country that of my knowledge affordeth plenty of dovecoats. But truth is, such was his fault, that upon every little discontent he would so please himself, from which he is thus easily to be reclaimed. But be sure, by watching and manning, he be made very gentle before you, begin thus to practice, and then call him and cranes to a catch, as I have taught you to do, a goshawk that will house, feed him in the same manner, and call him unto you, find that he will come so soon as the catch is thrown out. It may be a dove that he loveth so well, but it is not much to the purpose what fowl it be, although it be a lure well garnished, for he will soon fall in love with anything wherewith he shall be so well pleased. When he is brought to that pass, he is truly in love with thee, and the catch, comes readily, and will endure all company. Then use him to draw after thee all times of the day, and take him down very often. I would advise that in the evening he might be called near unto a dove house, where some of purpose should show and stir the doves, that if he went into the house, one of your company, rather than yourself, might be quickly with him having in readiness prepared a box filled with beaten pepper. And where he hath broken the dove, strew the pepper abundantly, and so have care, so soon as he shall bear a new place, that ye presently ply that place with strewing more pepper, which will soon make him dislike such, and so hope a diet, and make him so much the more to love him, who shall so have so kindly used him. I would show myself a little negligent, and not with much haste to take him down, when he were so near that he loveth so well, for now you are so near him, as you would quickly be with him to give unto him more than he would eat, and thereby make him out of love with the dove house. It may be said this is the next way to kill him. No, he will cast his gorge, wherein there is no danger or cause of fear. When a hawk casteth his gorge upon dislike of his meat, for sometimes the lying of a bone awry will make him cast his meat, or part of it. But if a hawk casteth his gorge, and the meat stinketh, this is of another cause, and he is then sick, his stomach cannot digest what nature desireth. And so the continuing thereof, with the desire to put it over, and cannot, putrefieth the meat and stinketh and maketh that hawk in a desperate estate. Your serving your tarsal thus shall not affect any such matter, but he will find a difference between such a distasteful supper and a sweet pleasing breakfast which I would advise should the next morning be given in cranes, where the sweet hand and kind dealing with him upon the catch will stay him or any hawk from roiling. When he is thus made, keep him so, and that must be with continual familiarity. If I thought a hawk so gentle and familiar could be drawn by any means from her keeper, then I would set down another course, which although you shall never have need of, I will set down. When he is at height of his familiarity, cut out of either wing three of his best flying feathers, and put to his heels a knocking pair of bells, and so train him when his want of power will hinder his desire to travel further. Then you may with ease follow him, and I would wish you would follow him so as he would not see it, but be continually thirty or forty score from him, and sometimes give him your voice. If you find him not inclined to hear you, which should be more strange to me than anything belonging to a hawk, 
if he be made gentle and in cranes well coming as aforesaid and get one with you that may follow him but never offer to take him down but let him as near the tarsal as may be who when he the hawk removeth by his voice he may give you knowledge thereof when i would advise you to give him your voice and call him but would go no nearer unto him when it groweth to that hour that you think he will remove no more then let a live dove by him that is with him be thrown out in a pair of cranes and so soon as he hath it let him be bestowed upon his fist until he cometh home where let him fast until you go to bed then for his supper give him a set of stones and knots the number and size i will deliver hereafter with the prophets the next morning carry him abroad with you an hour before you call him then let him go at liberty you have your friend if you need be to follow him whereof there shall be no need then let him see you kill and pull off the feathers of a pigeon and before you call he will come so soon as you throw out the catch and if he could speak thank you when you have made him such as you would have him then put in his feathers again which i hope were so carefully cut out and so well prepared in a book until you should have this use for them that he may be better imped with his own feathers than it is possible to imp a hawk with any other of his own and he will not fly one pin the worse i cannot in my understanding think of any other fault that my hawk hath therefore hereof i must of necessity leave further to speak and so proceed with my cures which follow in this third and last treaty end of chapter ten end of the second treaty The Third Treaty of Burt's Treaty of Hawks and Hawking by Edmund Burt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Third Treaty of Hawks and Hawking, wherein is contained cures for all known diseases, all of which been practiced by myself more upon other men's hawks that have been set unto me than upon any of my own. First, for the beak, mouth, eyes, head, and throat, and of the several griefs their breeding and offending. In the beak there is a dry canker, whereof I have little desire to write, because it is so common, and the cure is easy. But to him that knoweth it not, this shall give him sufficient understanding, that showeth itself white in that part of the beak where it is. It may have a crack or flaw in it, before you shall discover it. Under that white it eateth into the beak. With a knife pare the white off so far and so deep as it hath eaten into the beak with a piece of glass new broken you may scrape it and make it more smooth than you can with a knife after you have fashioned the beak so well as you can wash it either with the juice of a lemon or with a little wine vinegar and it will require to be no oftener dressed and cure a medicine for the wet canker in the mouth or beak which will eat into her eyes and brain and unless it be killed it will soon kill her and this is more common with the long-winged hawk than the short-winged hawk. This is my own practice, and how dangerous soever it shall appear to him that hath not made use thereof, believe me, in the administering thereof there is nothing but safety. Take aquafortis, ye shall have it at the goldsmith, for there is most use made of it. There is some of it made more strong than other, but how strong or weak soever it be, you shall qualify them in this manner. Have in a readiness a porridge or a spring water, and a feather in it then pour some of your aquafortis into the deep side of an oyster shell where you shall see it presently boil as if it were over a fire and would soon eat through the oyster shell take your feather in the spring water and therewith of the same water drop into the aquafortis that is boiling by drops drop after drop until you shall see it leave seething then for your use put it into a vial and we call it aquafortis qualified now you are provided of aqua forty in his vigor and strength and you have it also qualified for the canker i would advise you to take the most speedy and most sure course to kill it and therefore for cure thus proceed 
with a quill made fit for the turn search the sore well and take off the roof that covereth and groweth fast to the sore as clean as may be unless the bleeding shall hinder the true search have in readiness a stick with a little clout tied to the end which wet in fair water you may therewith wipe away the blood sometimes whereby you may the better see what you have done to the sore you may perhaps find a little core feeding within the sore pull and get out of it as much as possible and then having a little stick with a little clout to the bigness of a small pea fastened to the end thereof and wet in the aquafortis and not have it otherwise than wet not that it shall drop herewith do but touch the sore once or twice that it may be wet and it will soon kill it dress it once in four and twenty-four hours and if it be not in a very desperate state when you begin therewith twice or thrice dressing shall be the most it shall need and if the core shall be at the first taken clean out it will not ask more dressing you may feed within one hour or an hour and a half after she is thus dressed and cure a medicine for the frowns wherein too the long-winged hawk is much more subject than is a short-winged hawk i have heard many men of this opinion that the frowns and canker are all one and such they were as held themselves very skilful but such have skill and judgment know that they were deceived in their opinions the frowns proceeding out of a heat and dryness in the body or of a bruise and it followeth most your fresh haggard although the sore hawk or tarsal is not free but are upon heat subject to that infirmity the older a hawk is she is the more hot and dry and you shall have suddenly grow upon an old haggard although she be well kept for it will grow upon that hawk soonest that is of a fretful disposition a falconer of judgment will hereupon work to seek out means to amend the cause and then every small matter will cure the grief when it is but little and new bread i have known it killed with washing her mouth with the juice of a lemon and so giving her stones out of the same juice this worketh as well in the body as in the mouth but aquafort is to be used for the frowns as i have directed for a canker is beyond all other receipts and cure otherwise for the frowns take of your aquafortis that is qualified and with a quill made for that purpose take off the scab or roof from the sore then with a stick and a cloth at the end thereof well wet in your qualified water wash the sore and although there be so much water as some of it doth go into her body i have found no hurt but profit thereby for without doubt it hath had an extraordinary working in her body without making any show of sickness but there have come from her drowsy mutes that have stood full of bubbles i have herewith recovered hawks troubled with a sore frowns and made them sound and cure an approved medicine for the frowns that is to be had in every town take a piece of good rock alum and burn it leisurely then pound it to as fine powder as may be then take a little english honey and a little of the powder let them be wrought together with a knife point and then your hawk cast and the scab clean taken away to the bottom fear not to make it bleed which you may wipe away as you were formerly taught and this receipt clapped upon it without doubt with less than six times dressing it shall kill it and let it be dressed once in four and twenty hours let her not be fed in two hours after she is dressed i could set down forty common recipes more for this grief and all needless for any one of these three last shall kill any frowns i would not have set down this last recipe but that aquafortis is not to be had in every place and cure a remedy for the colonels whereunto the long-winged hawk is not subject but it follows much the short-winged hawk the colonels began and breed under the eye between the eye and chap outwardly appearing and will very soon show itself as big and long as the half of an ordinary bean and will soon grow greater and swell up the eye and kill her if it not be prevented for cure thereof do thus lance the place well swelled long ways and with a quill take out the kernels as you can they are white as kernels and cattle 
but I pray understand that they are of a very small size. Without any danger you may cut the hole large enough. Seize some spring water, and when it hath thawed, put into it a piece of rock alum and some English honey. Let it seize no more, but let the ingredients dissolve therein. Then having a linen cloth fastened to the end of a stick, wet in the water, the water not being otherwise than the cold taken off, wash the place very clean within, and then put into it some powder of burnt alum. You shall need to put your alum into it but once, and once it must be, otherwise it will be in four and twenty-four hours closed up again, and show itself healed, and so the kernels increase again, and very soon be as ill as it was at the first. But the alum once applied, and the place washed three mornings together, fear it not, for it is not cured and sound. End cure. There is a disease in the head of some called vertigo. It is a swimming of the brain, and thus followeth the cure. This grief is very dangerous, and it appeareth too plainly, for very seldom the hawk holdeth still her head, but continually putteth her head over her shoulder, and so letteth it fall to his proper place again. It proceedeth of a cold cause in the body. Take a quantity of butter out of the churn. Do not wash it. Take a clove of the middle size and as much mace. Let them be bruised, not beaten, and lap them in a little of your butter, to the bigness of a stone, such as you gave that hawk. Although it be very large, it will be a casting little enough. Put into a fine piece of lawn, and then tie it fast. Give it into your hawk, and after it, give unto her her supper. In the morning she will cast the lawn again, with the clove and mace therein, the butter passing through her, then give unto her a clove of sudden garlic. And because every man hath not made use thereof, I will therefore set down the manner how to seethe it, for it is very profitable for great uses. Take the cloves out of the head, but do not peel them. Seethe them in fair water, and with a spoon peel them very often, lest they overseethe for they must be soft, and yet no softer, but that if your hawk will not take them in meat, they may be put into her without breaking. But now the husk and thin white film must be taken off, given to her, her breakfast before, or therewith she will not only endue it, but that will work good digester for other meat. At night give her butter, clove, and mace again. As for said, and so every night, every third morning a clove of sudden garlic, until she be cured. Keep her warm and continually hooded. If she be not quiet, let her be mailed up. End cure. The pine in the throat of a most desperate and incurable disease. I have never heard of a long-winged hawk troubled with it, but I have known many short-winged hawks killed with it. This disease is plainly discovered, for upon any bait she will heave and blow and rattle in the throat. In my very friend's house, I found a goshawk at that pass. It is ten years since, and they did not perceive it until that day. My advice was desired, which I delivered, and thus put in practice. They did cause presently some butter to be made, which I took not washing it, but I lapped or anointed a wing feather of a hen therewith, and so twice or thrice in a day put it up and down her windpipe and thrice or twice at a time. Whether this was the pine or no, I know not, or the pine breeding, but I am sure that in three or four days the hawk did well, without any other thing administered. And by others it was thought to be the pine. One sparrow hawk had the pine this last year in her forage, and I told her master of the happy proceeding I had with the goth hawk, and he did practice the same but I believe he rather put the feather, which was but small, into the throat, than into the windpipe, for within one fortnight and ten days after it begun, she died thereof. One other goshawk was brought unto me in a ruster hood, to be made flying, as he said that brought her. She had been drawn three weeks, and for a fortnight and more she had taken every night a casting. The hawk I knew for her goodness and good conditions could not be bettered. I was glad of her coming, my house being full of my friends. I imparted so much unto them in the evening. Having formerly been well acquainted with her good conditions, 
I pulled off her hood. After a while, sitting quietly, she made a stout bait. But so soon as she had done so, she gaped and rattled so in the throat as that she might easily be heard into the next room. If this were not the pine, then no hawk hath the pine. But the sight hereof did very much perplex me. To be rid of her I could not, for her master was ridden into the country a hawking journey, as his own letter that day sent did testify. Seeing in what desperate a state the hawk was in, I would willingly have given forty shillings I had not meddled with her. He was a worthy knight that brought her, and to him I stood bound for many former kind gifts, which was in truth the most special cause that increased my grief, rather fearing her death than hoping for life. The next day, by some occasion, there were two knights, both of them very judicious ostringers, and two gentlemen of the same family, though dwelling ten miles asunder, and diverse others, all which, for my cold comfort, said she was a hawk not to be recovered. Then I practiced upon her in this manner. First I put on her ruster hood again, and then, with a large feather, lapped about with butter, I did twice or thrice together, and three times in a day put up and down her throat. I pray you remember that it was butter out of the churn and not washed. Whilst I was in this practice, I must tell you that she did not thereupon leave her rattling in the throat at all, but it did increase a while after she was dressed, and made a greater noise, and a great reason for it, for she had in her dressing strive very much, and now laboring in the body, her throat full of butter, she must needs make the noise the greater, which after she stood still a while, and was quiet, she never made show of. After a week's practice thus, I tied two feathers together, in such manner as some arrows and bolts for crossbows have their feathers lapped about. Then did I clip off half the deep side of the feather, and being dry, I put that into her windpipe, putting it up and down, and turning it round, insomuch that the feather was bloody. It troubled me much, but the cure being desperate, I thus followed on my practice. I confess I never had that experience before. I had then two other feathers lapped together with silk, as the other two were, about and into which I had lapped and wrought the powder of burnt alum and English honey, prepared as I taught you for the frounce and with that I did rub her windpipe up and down once a day, for three days together, and so left, knowing that it had wrought much in so short a time upon a sore frounce. I continued this hawk one week longer in her hood, when she gave me assured knowledge that she had no pine, neither would she blow for one bait or two or three, if they were not great, and for that blowing, I do not think it was the paintiff, but rather a faintness and weakness after her sickness, as it is very commonly approved amongst ourselves after a long sickness, and her disease was none of the least. I met with the messenger that brought her unto me, within one week after I had her, unto my head parted my grief for the hawk. When he did confess unto me, she had met with two or three mischances, by scratching her hood before she came unto me, which might be a cause of breeding the pine, which, being the greater grief, would not suffer the lesser to be seen until that was cured, which was the paint if, if it so prove. You have herein heard my opinion, but for the paint if I cannot meddle with, further in my discourse would prove very tedious, as to deliver the cause thereof, etc. I should compare it to the tick in a man or woman, or to a horse, which some say is broken-winded, and I should contrary that opinion. And although I should have many against me, yet I would have them maintain my opinion. And thus I leave that undiscoursed of, because it would prove very tedious to set down the reasons, pro and contra. But for this uncurable disease, I am persuaded that if it shall be rubbed with two dry feathers, lapped together and clipped, as I have before said, and afterward to wet them in aquafortis that is qualified, and so thrust the feather up and down her throat, I must needs think it should eat away the pine, and cure it, having so good experience of the working thereof, which doth confirm my opinion 
and not to danger the hawk. Admit it should endanger her life, she can be in no greater danger than the pine putteth her in. I leave the use thereof to your own consideration and cure. An excellent medicine for a lash in the eye. Take white sugar candy, burn it as you burn your alum, then bruise or beat it to a very fine powder, and thereof morning and evening put some of it into her eye. Let her be always hooded, until she be well, which will be in a very short time. Yea, although a film begin to grow over it, because it hath not been looked unto in time, yet rest assured it will cure it, and cure. A medicine for a salt or hot humor that runneth out of the eye, and scaldeth all the feathers from that part under the eye, and maketh it bare. This disease will make the one eye seem bigger than the other, and at all times seem to be full of water. It may be both eyes be in that ill estate. The often wiping of the eye against the wing putteth off the feathers, and maketh the eye the worse. For cure, take the stalk of fennel and cut it off at one joint, and into that part of the stalk, which you leave long, being stopped with the joint at the other end, ye shall put or fill with a powder of white sugar candy, very finely pounded, and then with wake make very close that end, and so do three or four, and then bury them in the earth two or three days, and your powder will be dissolved into fine water, which ye shall drop into your hawk's eye, or your own, if ye shall have need. It is approved very good and cure for the same otherwise take a piece of gum dragon and let it lie three or four spoonfuls of spring water until it dissolve and grow soft then drop of that water into the eye it is very good for ourselves if we have need and cure for a snurt of cold in the head of any hawk it is most properly to be termed thus in long wing hawks for short-winged hawks the rye, and yet they differ. I have flown falcons that have been washed at the brook in cold and frothy weather, or so wet with rain, that thereupon they have been so troubled with a cold in the head, as that in a month or six weeks they could not be brought again to true flying. The rye in a short-winged hawk will grow as well upon her, and sooner, by being ill-kept without tiring or plumage, or by being in poverty as through cold or wet, notwithstanding she is the tenderer hawk. Yet if she be full of flesh, and have natural means, good and warm diet, with plumage and tiring enough, and kept warm, she will soon outgrow it. But for the falcon and such like, a wild pimrose root dried in the oven, after the bread is drawn, and made so dry as that it may be beaten to a fine powder, and so blown into her nares, will very soon break it. If you will take the leaves, be sure they be of the wild primrose in the field, or wood, stamp and strain out of the juice, and put some of it into her nares, and it shall work the like effect. It shall not be idleness for me to deliver, nor yet unprofitable for you to hear, that one did lie in his bed so troubled with pain in the head, that upon the least motion or stirring he would cry out in such manner as that, he showeth he suffered much torment. I was talking to one of this receipt for my hawk, whereupon the party's petitions were so piercing as that there must be no denial, but that some leaves should be sought for and gotten, and which was done, the juice taken out. I think he did snuff up into his nose one spoonful, but he was for half an hour after so tormented as that I for my part, wish that I had never spoken of the receipt, but that little season so borne out, the party was presently as well as ever he was in his life. This was sudden, and this was strange. Administer neither of these to your hawk, but when she is empty, and feed not too soon after it, but be sure to keep her warm, for otherwise her powers being so open, she is more apt to increase the cold she hath already taken than to break it. End cure. A cure for the mites. Some hawks have been so ill looked unto that they have not only been troubled about the beak and eyes, but the nicks of the wing and hinder parts of them have been eaten to the quick. 
His judgment should much fail him that will not think the hawk so ill furnished have been neither cleanly kept nor carefully looked into by both which means the hawk may have them and they soonest gotten from the perch or block where another hawk hath fate that have had the mites if they be timely discovered and that they have not overrun the whole body aquavide and stawsaker will kill them only rubbing her nares therewith when you set her down for the all night and so will vinegar and stawsaker the juice of herb grass the leaves stamped and drained and the parts offended about the head rubbed therewith when you go to take your rest is as good as any of the rest take heed where you set your hawk for if she sit by a hawk that hath the mites she will too soon find that she hath met with too many ill neighbours master bachelor that was master of all the falconers by pals to whom my love then was such as that i could speak much good of him now he i say had a spar hawk our body overrun with such vermin which he could destroy by no means until he did undertake this course he got stossaker and beat it small and then boiled it in fair water making it strong and then strained it gently through a fine cloth suffering none of the stossaker to go through and in that he did well wash his hawk and when he had her out of the water he lapped her up in a lamb skin that was made warm and ready for that purpose and therein he kept her until she was very near dry when having another skin warmed he put that about her and so continued two hours into which the lamb skins the vermin did run and so the hawk was made clean and freed from her death and cure a receipt beyond all other to take out the lime of a hawk's feathers take neat's foot oil any oil else will never be gotten out of the feathers and anoint the place lined therewith that done draw the web of the feather even as it groweth from the quill between the flesh of your forefinger and the nail of your thumb with the nail never leave working until therewith you have drawn the lime clean out and then you shall find the feathers look with as good as a gloss as any of the rest and stand as smooth as you draw them and cure a receipt to be given to a hawk that bloweth and is short or thick-winded i was once asked by one of my friends what was good for such an infirmity i told him the tops of rosemary leisurely dried between two warm tiles either made warm and set upon hot embers to continue them so or in an oven so soon as the bread was taken out and when they were so well dried as that they would be beaten to a fine powder to give the powder in good abundance to his hawk with her meat i made it known unto him that this was taught me by one that was an ancient and skilful ostringer and withal told him that i had made no use thereof neither could i allege a reason why it should be good as he was a falconer so he was a cockmaster and he told me that he had made use of it in such manner for his cocks since when for a hawk so troubled i have made proof of and found it very profitable and cure a medicine for the worms wherewith all creatures i think as well as hawks are troubled Phos sulphurous given in her meat is very good and so is cholerinum otherwise called sea moss dried and in powder given the hawk with her meat pulvis contra vermis is to be had at some apothecaries given with her meat in the morning she will not at all fly the worse at night lavender cotton minced and made into a pill with butter and rolled up in sugar is good casting of wormwood and sanctuary are very good sodden garlic in my practice is better than any of these there can be no better thing be given to a long wing hawk for the philanders if so it must then be granted nothing can help digest her better you shall find how it is sudden in the chapter for the disease in the head i have given every night a clove to a short-winged hawk six nights together warm feet given with meat or warm feet with aloes butter and two or three chives of saffron given in a pill is very good and i think so were a hundred more medicines for this disease and there are more hawks die hereof than of all other diseases besides and cure a medicine or pill to be given to a hawk 
that half the worms whereof I make the best allowance. Take English honey and clarify it. Take off the scum with a feather when it hath boiled a little, and then it is clarified. Let it boil leisurely until it grow so stiff as that you can make it up in pills, which you shall thus approve. Take a little out of it upon a knife's point and drop it upon a trencher. When it is cold, you shall see whether it be stiff enough or no. Then beat some worm seed and put it into it. So make it up in pills. I will tell you how I do use to give them. I lap them up in a single white paper of the thinnest paper I can get, and then I put therein my pill and tie the paper close about with a thread. I am very careful not to touch the outside of the paper after I have handled the pills before I wash, for fear she should take any dislike in the taste. I put it into so thin a paper that it may the sooner dissolve, for if it be a thick paper that will not so soon take moisture, I have approved both. And then if she offer to cast it, she may with so strong paper cast all, which to prevent, if I know anything my hawk will dislike, I show her that it will be a means to make her keep it. Otherwise I will have in a readiness a wing of some fowl, wherewith I will tender, sometimes with showing it, and sometimes suffering her to plume, by which means you shall have your pill or pills work kindly. You may give two as big as a small hazelnut to a goshawk, one to a tarsal. It is a good scouring, besides the benefit of killing worms. I have heard very experienced ostringers say that there is no killing of worms with any such receipt as I have mentioned. But their advice is to be a small flint stone to small pumice and to give it her with her meat. And this, they say, must first break the bed of worms. And then after these receipts will kill them. I cannot understand where these worms should lie that must have this help and without which the other cannot profit. I have seen a small grub worm in long-winged hawks, and especially in the blank tarsals that have been muted daily, sometimes two, sometimes three, sometimes four, and a mute, and more. And to kill these I have labored, but I will never approve it more, for I cannot do it. And besides, I think they rather benefit a hawk than do any hurt. For I flew a tarsal so troubled all his forays, and when he was an intermure, until after Christmas at the cock, he was a very high flyer that years remained. And three years after, he was a lead hawk at the brook in Leicestershire, and all this time had these worms, and he was called by that name Worms. I put in mind of giving a hawk brimstone by speaking of the pounded flint, and I have very often approved it to give it in this manner to any hawk, broken like small gravel, and at night give it with her meat, and she will in the morning bring it up in her casting. It will help greatly to clean a hawk and breed a good stomach. There is not so common a disease followeth a hawk as the worms, and I have found them in most feathered fowls, but never any within the bowels, but in the body most abundantly, and without all doubt the back worm. If a man were certain his hawk were so diseased, both the pill and sudden garlic with continuance would destroy and cure. A recipe for a hawk that lost her courage, enjoyeth not, or is low in flesh. Take a wild hawk and well-fleshed house dove, and draw out a wing. You know what to par away, and how to prepare it fit for your hawk. Take a new laid egg, whilst it is warm, and warm a porridge or pewter dish against the fire. Then break the egg and put the yolk therein too. Let it be broken a little with a spoon, and then draw your meat through it, and as your hawk is feeding, with a feather lay on more. I would have this so quickly done, as that the dove nor egg should lose but little of their natural heat, and by making it more hot, you make it worse than the losing of the heat. Use this but two or three mornings, and you shall find your hawk grow bravely upon you. For a hawk to be proud and full of flesh, is but a spur and whetstone to put her into all ill conditions if she be wild but let her be gentle and not wild she is able to kill anything that is fit to be flown unto and cure 
Another recipe very good for the same purpose. Take a pound of beef of a young beast, or more beef if you will. Make it very clean, not leaving either fat or string therein. You may the better do it because the beef must be sliced very thin, which when it is so sliced and well picked, lay it in a still, and put thereto as much claret wine as the best high country wine you can get, as may cover the beef. Put thereto one or two ounces of white sugar candy, beaten to fine powder, and then still them together, but let the still be very temperately kept, and through this you may often draw your hawk's meat. End of cure. How to draw water that is cooling, and the property thereof is to kill any unnatural heat in the mouth or body. It is a great cleanser, and increaseth breath. It will keep the body in good temper, and help the body distemper with heat. I would gladly set down everything so plainly, as that there might neither be question made of my meaning, nor that there should be anything mistaken, for want of a true description. Prim, of some called prim privet, it is that which is planted in some orchards and in some gardens to beautify the walls, and is kept with cutting. It doth carry a white flower, which when they are blown, I would have cleanly picked, taking nothing but the flower. Let not your fire be kept over rash or over hot, but let them be carefully distilled, and then put it into a glass until you have use of it. No hawk will dislike the taste of the water, and the water thus stilled hath a very good smell, but it leaveth the most stinking still. If you shall give her this water with her meat, you shall find admirable profit therein. It is very good wherewith to inseam a hawk of any kind, for a long-winged hawk that is in summer flown to the field. There never was or can be used anything better. It is most true that in giving something to heat the stomach, you may therewith overheat the liver. And it is so for the liver. Give something to cool that, and so you may overcool or kill the stomach. But there is such an excellent property in this water, as with not standing it cooleth the liver, yet it bettereth the stomach. The use of this water will prevent many diseases, for infirmities and sickness do continually follow such hawks, as are not cleanly fed, but flown fowl, before they be well and seamed, it will keep thy goshawk and tarsal in continual health, if you be careful in the enseaming of them, and not flying of them before they be clean. If you will not be careful, but thy overly hasty desire of sport shall make thee fly them before they be fit to fly, then you shall have from them for a little season some sport. But then the conclusion will be confusion. To be weak and sickly is the best hope can be had of a hawk, het or flown, before she be clean. But to be het or flown when she is more than foul, so soon as cold weather doth come, be assured of the plaintiff. And other diseases which will fall into her feet and legs, and then as good pull off her head as keep her. I know not any man that hath made the use thereof but myself, and I have used it this sixteen or seventeen years, and I did never impart to any man but one night what it was, who to my knowledge did never cause it to be drawn. End cure. A very excellent medicine for a dangerous bruise, presently to be given after the hurt. Take English honey and clarify it, and so soon as you have so done, before it boileth any more, put into it a half so much stone pitch or something less than there is honey, and then let it boil again. It shall not need to boil long, because the pitch will make it strong and fast enough to make up in pills. As soon as you can give her a large pill thereof, and although she fast above twelve hours after receiving, it is the better. I pray let me make all plain unto you, for this is worthy to be had in good estimation, both of the falconer and ostringer. It is a practice of my own devising, and thus I use the same. I have had diverse tarsals flying at the cock so hurt themselves that they have not been able to stand or hold up a wing. I have presently mailed them to keep them warm until I came home, 
I tell you this because you shall understand that it is very dangerous to let them take cold before the receipt of this pill or pills. For making them something less, you may give them two. When I came home, I would keep her still mailed up, lest she should catch cold until I made her pills ready. When I would not yet unmail her, if I found it a dangerous bruise, but keep her so all night or day, and I would be sure that when I did unmail her to feed, or to see how she could stand, it should be in a very warm chamber, where there should be a good fire. I did fly a goshawk that was not my own, for which hawk I was offered forty pounds. I could not, and her master would not sell her. The next year she had such a bruise upon her body against a small tree, not much bigger than my leg, crossing to catch a pheasant cock, that she lay there to the beholders dead. And there she had been dead, but that this accident happened very near unto one that was with me. When I came into her, I saw her eyes stir a little. I opened her mouth, and I put my finger down her throat. She stirred no part of her body. I lapped her up in a good fellow's jerkin that was with me, and so I carried her under my arm to a house two miles from thence. I found she had life in her, and then I had hope. I gave her two pills, such as I have formerly spoken of. She did lie so lapped up at the least sixteen hours. And when I did unmail her to see her strength, she was very unable to stand, and hardly able to offer to stand. I fed her very short, but with my care in one week I delivered her to her master. With some directions, and all the time I had her after her bruise, she never cast any meat. But after I parted from her, she would once in three or four meals cast part or all of her meat. My consent was asked, and I came thither that her head might be pulled off. I would not yield to that, but upon easy terms I took her home with me. In the strand I met with that worthy baron, who before had made means to buy her, and he asked me if I would not help him to that goshawk. I told him truly in what desperate case she was in, and in all the truth. He said, you will recover, you will recover that, that I promised if she did recover, he should have her, and at Easter term, she receiving her hurt near shroud tide, I did deliver her a very sound hawk, and I had for her thirty pounds, and her well-proving was worth twenty pounds more unto me. One other goshawk I recovered, that wanted not much of her danger, and her master sold her in Suffolk for fifteen or sixteen pounds, and a young goshawk clean mewed out of the mew. I dare write no untruth. For this must be overviewed by the actors. What shall I need to set down any more for this, knowing this to be so approved good, and which maketh it the more excellent? It is to be had in every place. So is neither parmacet nor mummel. I could mention more, but all worthless in respect. If you will give anything else, let it be mamma beaten into powder, and so given with her meat. You shall find it in the morning in her casting, and it is very good where the other is unknown. End of cure. A receipt for a wound or hurt taken either by a dog or the claws of a hare or otherwise. Have a special care that the wind or cold enter not into the wound before you have wherewith to dress it. If it be where you can have sovereign balm, there is nothing better. That is to be had but in a few places and therefore, for want thereof, take a quantity of spring water, and let it seed. Then take it from the fire, and put it into a piece of rock alum, and some English honey, and so let them dissolve in the water, the water being blowed warm. Therewithal wash the sore, it will keep it clean from putrefying, and heal it, but still careful that it doth not take cold, and cure. A Medicine for the Cray this grief proceedeth of a hot and dry cause, and it is a dainty cure. Haws distilled, and the meat drawn through the water is very good. To draw your hawk's meat through cow's milk, warm from the cow, is very good, and so approved. End cure. Another for the same. 
Milk from the cow distilled is excellent good for that grief, but thus followeth a discommodity, it cooleth and hurteth the stomach. I have known this water used for the stone, but the discommodity was soon found. But if you will distill a pint and a half of milk, and withal an ounce of white sugar candy finely pounded, it will rectify all. It hindereth not in its property for the cray, and yet it will doth now comfort the stomach and cure. Another for the same, and the best of any for the same. I have known some par the end of a candle to a small quantity, and so put it into her tool gently, and it hath done good. But I use castle soap, and thereof cut a piece an inch long in manner of a soap of feta, and so put it up and so leave it. This is very good. But with all I have powered a little of such soap, and conveyed it into the gut of a fowl, being very careful of the cleanly doing it, not knowing whether the taste might offend or no. So done, I cast my hawk, and I put it down, and then I feed upon it, to make her the better to put it over. This with the sofa will so soon open and make glide the passages that you shall soon find amendment in your hawk and cure. Otherwise for the same, I was taught to put up in the manner of a glifter oil of roses with a siren and cure. A receipt for a strain or bruise in the foot. Take a handful of mallows and boil them either with the neat's foot oil, goose grease, capon's grease, or hog's grease. When they are well boiled, strain them through a cloth and then mingle them with good aqua vitae and let them boil all together a little and therewith anoint the place and cure Phoenice. end of burt's treaty of hawks and hawking by edmund burt